Okay, good morning and welcome to the City Council's first day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and the Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson. We've been joined by my colleagues, let me start over here with Councilmember Margaret Chin, Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer, Councilmember Mark Traeger, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Councilmember uh, Keith Powers, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, and others will probably be joining us shortly. Today marks the first day of the Council's Charter Mandated Responsibility to review the Mayor's Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget. This morning, we will begin with testimony from the Office of Management and Budget, and then we will hear from the Department of Design and Construction. On April 25th, the Mayor released the Fiscal 2020 Executive Budget, totaling $92.5 billion. The Executive Plan includes $1.4 billion in new needs spending between Fiscal 19 and Fiscal 20. Most of the new needs are as a result of cuts implemented in this year's state budget or are education related. Some of the new needs included in the preliminary budget are $125 million to replace a state cut for temporary assistance for needy families, $304.7 million for Carter case funding to place students needing special education services in private schools, $88.3 million for increased charter school cost, and $59.4 million for energy management associated with the mayor's recent announcement of a Green New Deal for New York City. While the administration was able to find sufficient funds for these items and for its other priorities, the budget is noticeably lacking significant input from the council because the administration largely ignored the council's budget response, which we are required to produce pursuant to the New York City Charter to respond to the mayor's preliminary budget. I am pleased to announce that there has been some movement on this issue, but I'll turn it over to the speaker now to talk about that in more detail. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Gibson, and I want to thank the entire Finance Division team for making today's hearing happen, only 10 days after the release of the executive budget. Before I begin my prepared remarks, I want to thank Director Hartzog for her very uh, great help and partnership over the last week. Uh, her team, along with our team, have worked really closely um, to try to achieve a bunch before this hearing today. So the remarks that I'm going to deliver are in no way personal to you, Director Hartzog. I really appreciate uh, the work that you have put into the last week of us getting down to the nitty gritty and the details that match the council. So I'm really appreciative. Uh, the remarks I'm going to deliver are generally about the administration and how I feel this budget response was handled. So to be honest, I was prepared to start off my remarks at today's hearing by uh, expressing my extreme displeasure uh, with the executive budget. I was ready to tell the mayor that this budget was unacceptable and that the road to adoption he initiated was untenable. The reason I was going to say this is because the executive budget included nearly none, none of the proposals, none of the proposals from the council's budget response. Or rather, I should clarify, the administration saw fit to implement our ideas from the response for how to save money, almost $600 million, and then took the savings that we identified to fund even more of the mayor's priorities. The council as a whole found this incredibly insulting because the budget response was deliberately crafted with input from the entire city council, as it should be as the mayor's partner in government. The budget negotiating team in the council deliberated for days and weeks about which proposals to include, and the final product clearly laid out our priorities. Pay parity and wage equity, increasing the city's reserves, achieving 100% of fair student funding, having a more transparent budget. These have been our priorities as delineated in our budget response, and they should be the mayor's priorities too, as he strives to make New York the fairest big city in America. That's what he likes to say. One of the critical items that we highlighted in the budget response was the failure of the administration to include uh, continuing funding for approximately $155 million in one-shot funding that we negotiated into the adopted budget for fiscal year 2019. These one-shots funded vital programs on which our constituents rely and enjoy, including adult literacy to teach English to adults across the city, the extension of beach and pool season, 
transition to a week past Labor Day, bridging the gap social workers who provide services for homeless students in our schools, the addition of 5,000 summer youth employment program slots, and post-arrest diversion programs, which will help reduce the city's jail population. So I am happy because of your hard work, Director Hartzog, with Latanya McKinney and both of your teams to announce that today, thanks to the advocacy of the council, which remained united in our position to the mayor, that $77 million of these fiscal 2019 one shots will be restored for fiscal 2020. That's about half of the one shots that we funded last year. The impact of avoiding these service cuts can't be overstated and I wanna thank you personally for your help in working with us to protect the city's social safety net. I'm happy with this process, but I do not think this is a time for celebration. The restoration of the one shots was only one item, one item in our budget response. And speaking frankly, they never should have been left out of uh, the budget, the executive budget in the first place. And I'd like, uh, to, I, I still like us to recognize that there is still a lot of work ahead. There are many, many other pro proposals that we feel like were entirely ignored. I don't think the failure to be responsive to us was about a lack of resources. This budget is a record 92.5 billion, with a B, billion dollars. As the mayor is fond of saying these days, there is plenty of money in the world, and there's plenty of money in New York City. But even if resources were an issue, the council put out many proposals that would cost the city nothing. New units of appropriation are free. More transparent reporting for cross-agency initiatives like Thrive or otherwise opaque parts of the budget like the ferries or shelter spending don't cost a dime. Yet even these ideas were rejected from the administration. So I'm glad that we're able to make some headway this week between the release of the executive budget and today's hearing, but we are a long, long, long way away from budget adoption. The council is ready to roll up its sleeves and continue to work together with the administration to get this done. I hope the administration is willing to do the same. You know, typically we try to get this budget adopted by the first week in June. I doubt that's possible, uh, and I'm willing to wait until just before July 1st to negotiate this and get this right. I feel under no time uh, restraint or that this needs to be done quickly. It needs to be done the right way. And uh, again, I'm grateful for our uh, partnership, our relationship, our over communicating with each other uh, now. But I think you will hear not just from my opening statements, but I think you're gonna hear from almost the entire membership of the council how disappointed they were with this executive budget. And I look forward to this hearing today. So Chair Drum, I wanna turn it back to you and thank you for your hard work on today's hearing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Another highly anticipated executive budget item is the savings package. Now that we have the details of the PEG in the citywide savings plan that we didn't have for the preliminary budget hearings, the council is struggling to understand the purpose of the PEG. Typically, typically PEGs are implemented during periods of tough economic conditions in order to identify true efficiencies and recurring savings. Until this year, the de Blasio administration, which has benefited from a relatively robust economy for its entire existence, decided to move away from PEGs in favor of a voluntary citywide savings program. Since the implementation of that program, the council has been urging the administration to search for savings more rigorously because the majority of the program consisted of accruals, re-estimates, and increased revenue projections that would have occurred even in the absence of a savings program. So when the administration announced a mandatory peg this year, the council was hopeful that the mayor was finally getting serious about reining in inefficient spending. To quote the Citizens Budget Commission, the PEG is in line with the administration's prior savings programs, and a majority of the savings are from expense re-estimates, increased revenues, funding shifts, and a debt service savings, rather than from improved efficiency. And even where the PEG does make true cuts, the administration chose to make them in the exact areas that the council identified as priorities for an increase in our budget response, such as funding for cultural institutions, youth services, and senior centers. The peg was couched in the context of a potentially worsening economic position for the city and the need for us all to tighten our belts in anticipation. 
So what is truly baffling is that in light of this sentiment, the administration has chosen not to add even a single dollar towards our reserves. As the mayor grows the budget and, the increase spe and increases spending, it is even more important to concomitantly and proportionally increase reserves. By not doing so, the administration is irresponsibly increasing the likelihood that deep programmatic cuts or tax increases will have to be made. The council reiterates the appeal it has been making to the mayor for years. Save more now while times are good so we are prepared for whatever the future has in store. And with that, I'll now turn the mic over to council member Gibson, Chair Gibson, to speak about the capital budget. Thank you, Chair Danny Trump, and good morning to each and every one of you. I welcome our OMB director and our first deputy director. Thank you for being here. I want to thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, for being here this morning and for his incredible leadership um, as we begin this executive budget process. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson, and I am proud to serve as chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget, and I am honored to co-chair this hearing today with Speaker Johnson and Chair Drum. Um, while I'd like to focus most of my remarks this morning on the capital budget, before I do so, I certainly want to reiterate everything that Speaker Johnson and Chair Drum expressed uh, that I, too, am pleased that the administration heard our many, many, many concerns um, at being ignored uh, through this process and today's announcement of the $77 million of one-shots um, in fiscal 2019 are going to be restored will truly ensure that there will not be cuts to these vital, important programs. As our budget negotiations continue towards adoption, I am hopeful that the mayor and OMB will continue to work with the City Council to ensure that even more of the items that were outlined as priorities in our budget response will be included in the adopted budget. And in addition, the $77 million is a great start, but we are obviously expecting that we can get to $155 million, which would be the full amount. Um, and on this note, one of the key requests that the Council has made throughout the preliminary budget hearings and in the preliminary budget response was that the administration present the City Council with a true 10-year capital strategy. While the $116.9 billion strategy presented with the executive budget did increase slightly from prelim, it still fails to live up to its intended purpose. The exercise of putting together the strategy should honestly be a serious attempt to lay out a comprehensive footprint, a blueprint for the long-term capital priorities of our city well beyond five years. But that is not what is reflected in this strategy. The strategy presents low levels of spending that are planned in fiscal 2025 through 2029 that are beyond unrealistic, with average annual spending amounts of only $6.5 billion and no planned spending in critical capital categories such as new schools. So our question has been, why even engage in the creation of a 10-year strategy if you're not making real attempts to take long-term capital planning extremely seriously? At the preliminary budget hearings that we held this year, the Council spent a lot of time discussing the need for our city to have a better comprehensive system for tracking capital projects. We appreciate that to this date, OMB has, at our request, put the capital project detailed data report on its website. Very happy about that. And we worked with agencies to ensure that they're filling out all of the information. I hope to see further progress made towards an accurate capital project tracking document that is useful to the Council, that also looks at capital projects that are less than $25 million as the threshold, and other fiscal monitors as well as being available to the public. While we're making progress, I expect for us to continue in this collective work. The executive capital budget for fiscal 2020 through 2023 totals $52.8 billion, and the executive capital commitment plan for fiscal 2019 through 2023 totals $86.2 billion. These are significant and necessary investments in our city's roadways, sewers, schools, housing, parks, playgrounds, and much more. 
My focus as chair of this subcommittee continues to be ensuring that the city's capital program is efficiently implemented in order to give New Yorkers the infrastructure improvements they rightly deserve. And I look forward to working with the administration to achieve just that. And I thank the finance division led by Latanya McKinney and all of the staff for their tremendous work through this process. And as we begin today's hearing, I want to thank OMB for your partnership. And we certainly look forward to a lot more. This is a start. I want to keep moving forward. I know we're making baby steps of progress, but I really appreciate the work uh, that you have been committed to do on capital commitments and making sure that we are really actualizing a real 10-year plan beyond five years. We want to make sure that in the next generation of council members and the, the administration, a lot of these capital commitments and priorities are realized over a 10-year period. So I thank you. Looking forward to today's hearing. And now I'll turn this back over to Chair Danny Drum. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Gibson. Uh, before we hear from OMB, I'd like to thank the entire Finance Division staff, led by Latanya McKenney, for putting today's hearing together. I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for OMB will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if the council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. We will now hear from OMB after they are sworn in by council. Excuse me, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, I apologize, Chair Drum. I was remiss in, in also not acknowledging the fact that this morning, uh, Director Hartzog and her team got us 28 units of appropriation, uh, which I'm grateful for. That was part of our conversation this past week. And I, before she began, I wanted to acknowledge, uh, because I didn't acknowledge in my remarks, that we're grateful for that progress as well. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to ask Council to swear in OMB. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. I do. Okay, please begin. Good morning. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Drum, Subcommittee, Chair Gibson, and Council Members for the opportunity to testify today about the fiscal year 2020 executive budget. I also want to thank Latanya McKinney and Council Finance staff for their positive and collaborative approach to the budget and the work that we've done over the last 10 days to reflect the Council's priorities. I'm joined at the table today by OMB First Deputy Director Kenneth Godner and our dedicated and hardworking OMB staff is here to assist me in answering questions. The fiscal year 2020 executive budget is $92.5 billion. It remains balanced and out-year gaps are manageable. This budget was crafted in light of threats to our fiscal stability. We continue to face uncertainty related to economic conditions at home and abroad. Despite job growth nationally, there are reasons to be cautious. The housing sector continues to be weak and aggregate consumption, the main engine of economic growth, slowed in the first quarter of this year. Also, the yield curve, a reliable indicator of recessions, is still flat, with spreads close to zero. We also face pressure from Albany. The state enacted budget imposed $300 million in cuts, shifts, and unfunded mandates on the city. The impact could have been much worse. During the state budget process, we work with our partners in the legislature to push back on more aggressive cuts. We're grateful for their help. State hits include $125 million in TANF costs, $96 million to support election reform mandates, $59 million designated for health care services, and a $25 million shortfall in education funding. Ultimately, more than one quarter of our fiscal year 2020 agency spending went towards filling these gaps. In addition to covering hits from Albany, the executive budget accounts for other pressing funding needs. This budget adds $100 million in fiscal year 2020 to meet existing Carter case demand. We also deepened our investment in special education by adding $33 million to increase DOE's capacity and reduce reliance on non-district schools. State-mandated charter school payments have also increased. The state did not cover this liability in its budget. In early April, charter school enrollment numbers became more concrete and OMB was able to determine the extent of next year's liability. This budget adds $88 million to meet this mandated need, bringing total spending on charter schools next fiscal year to $2.3 billion. Finally, the state informed us earlier in the year that it would no longer split the cost of criminal pretrial mental health evaluations. As a result, we had to add $65 million over this fiscal year and the next. 
Despite economic uncertainty and increased costs due to state budget actions, we must continue to fund critical government operations. This includes paying fair wages and benefits to employees, educating our children, and maintaining and improving our infrastructure. At the preliminary budget presentation, the mayor announced a mandatory executive budget savings target of $750 million. It would include the administration's first program to eliminate the gap, an expansion and an expansion of the hiring freeze. The target was on top of the $1.6 billion in savings we achieved over fiscal years 2019 and 2020 since the November plan. In the executive budget, we surpassed the original $750 million target, achieving $916 million in savings over the two fiscal years. This includes $629 million in agency peg savings, $84 million above the $545 million target. The PEG differs from previous saving efforts in both process and outcome. Agencies were given mandatory targets based on specific characteristics. OMB had discretion to impose savings if an agency was non-compliant. And unlike in prior savings plans, we did not rule out service reductions. Due to the hard work of OMB and the agencies, we exceeded our PEG target, which allowed us to balance fiscal year 2020's budget. The PEG contains nearly 200 individual agency savings initiatives, the most this administration has ever included in a single savings plan. Also, the mix of savings categories in the PEG varies substantially from prior plans. For the first time in this administration, service reductions were enacted as part of the savings plan, including eliminating extended time learning at renewal and rise schools, reducing operating grant subsidies for members of the cultural institutions group, eliminating DVD purchases for the New York Public Library, and cutting vacant lot cleaning operations by nearly one-third. Agencies also achieved high levels of efficiency savings. In fiscal year 2020, the first full year impacted by the PEG, efficiencies account for two-thirds of the savings. To achieve these savings, agencies streamlined and improved practices, yet maintained service levels. This includes DOE procurement reforms that will save $27 million per year. DOE has now achieved $50 million in annual procurement savings since the preliminary budget. And by lowering central administrative spending, ACS will save $2 million each year. Finally, we expanded the hiring freeze. By permanently reducing 1,600 positions across agencies, we saved $116 million over fiscal years 2019 and 2020. The hiring freeze expansion builds on the $50 million in savings we baselined in November by reducing 1,000 vacancies. And for the first time in this administration, we reduced the citywide net annual headcount. In addition to our aggressive savings plan, we maintained $5.72 billion of budget reserves in fiscal year 2020. This record level includes $1 billion in the general reserve, $250 million in the capital stabilization reserve, and $4.47 billion in the Retiree Health Benefits Trust. Last June, we worked with you to add $125 million in general reserves and $100 million to the Health Benefits Trust in the current fiscal year. We look forward to discussing next year's reserve levels with the Council as we head towards adoption. Now I'd like to discuss investments. Most agency spending in the executive budget is related to funding ongoing needs. These investments are necessary to maintain basic city operations. Over the two years, we will spend $57 million to fund Board of Elections needs for upcoming elections, $56 million to maintain water and sewer systems, $38 million to fund DOE's rent and operating costs, and $23 million to address NYPD's critical IT infrastructure needs. Because of our aggressive savings plan, we were also able to fund a number of council priorities. To increase energy efficiency with green technology, we invested $60 million to support retrofits for public buildings. We added funding to support outreach and public awareness campaigns for the city's 2020 census efforts. This brings the total census investment to $26 million. The Bridge the Gap program for students in shelter is now baselined at $12 million. Finally, we invested $6 million to refurbish NYCHA senior and community centers. And in addition, as the speaker mentioned at the beginning of the hearing, the administration and council have agreed to fund $77 million in council priorities next fiscal year. And in addition to that, as the units of appropriation, we're actually up to 34, speaker, and hope to grow that number more. 
This will support a range of initiatives, the $77 million, from adding 5,000 summer youth employment slots to expanding adult literacy programming. Along with the executive budget, we released the 10-year capital strategy. The $116.9 billion plan supports the city's infrastructure needs. The plan funds critical projects like adding school seats, expanding Housing New York 2.0, and improving our roadways and sewer systems. Further, the capital strategy now reflects $8.7 billion in funding for borough-based jails. In this capital strategy, we continue to prioritize state of good repair. Three quarters of capital funds are invested in maintaining or improving the city's capital asset base. As part of our ongoing efforts to reflect more realistic capital project timelines, we redistributed $3.9 billion from fiscal years 2019 through 2021 into the out years. We also proposed $2.3 billion of rescindments from prior capital budgets. Finally, we want to continue to work with the Council to improve transparency in the capital program. As requested by Subcommittee Chair Gibson at the last hearing, we added the capital detail data reports to our website. Also, OMB recently met with Subcommittee Chair Gibson and Councilmember Lander to discuss the path towards developing a capital project tracking system. In conclusion, I look forward to meeting with you over the next few weeks to discuss our mutual priorities and work towards adopting the fiscal year 2020 budget. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I now look forward to taking your questions. Thank you, uh, Director Hartsock, for your testimony. Um, so the budget process, uh, as envisioned by the city's charter, is an iterative one that mandates a comprehensive and lengthy public discussion of budget priorities. First, as you know, but the public should know, the mayor releases a balanced preliminary budget. The council has hearings, listens to the public, and then produces an official response. After that response, the council's preliminary budget response, the mayor is tasked with releasing an executive budget. In this way, the executive budget is supposed to reflect the mayor's formal reply to the city council's budget response. The process is laid out in the charter, and it reflects the intention for a back and forth, a conversation. As I mentioned in my opening, the council is grateful for your hard work in getting to $77 million in one-shot restorations for this morning. But the fact remains that it is only a portion of one of our many budget response proposals, and we should not have had to wait until, the, until after the executive budget was released to have one, a portion of one of our proposals included. So my question, uh, I'd like to know whether you and the mayor agree with the description of the back and forth budget process in the charter that I just laid out. And if you don't, then why do you suppose the charter requires a budget response from the city council prior to the mayor's executive budget? The mayor and I fully agree with what the intent of the charter is. And I think that, as you um, pointed out, in the executive budget, we did reflect, in fact, several of the council's priorities. To your point, going forward, that was not sufficient, and we've worked over the last several days to add another 77 million. But in addition to reflecting several of the council's priorities in the executive budget, the census funding, the students and shelter, in preliminary budget, we also reflected our commitment to fair fares at 106 million, and at adoption of last year, we also baselined 55.9 million of council priorities at that point in time for things, items such as the child care vouchers, runaway homeless youth, nurse family partnership, and crisis management. And moving forward, the fair student funding to get to a citywide average of 93%, the 125 million we added at the executive budget of last year is baseline, and that's also a council priority. So there are several things that we did over the course of from last exec until the current executive budget that reflect the council priorities, but we also acknowledge that we need to go further and we've done so. And we also acknowledge there's more to do as we get to adoption. I appreciate that acknowledgement. Does the fiscal 2020 executive budget that the mayor released on April 25th reflect his official reply to the council's budget response? The, the, it is the official response, but we also have what we've just committed to moving forward, which is the $77 million. Okay. So I want to go to increased uh, personal income tax collections. When the mayor released his preliminary budget, he noted that he was releasing the budget in the midst of very uncertain times. You'll see 
uh, this quote on the screen. He said, there's a pretty strong debate right now about whether a recession is coming in 2019 or 2020, but there is uh, a very high likelihood that it's going to be one year or the other. Uh, and the biggest challenge in developing the budget, he cited, was the economy. He specifically noted that revenues from personal income tax were weakening, though he did acknowledge that part of what happened was a drop from a one-time bump in fiscal 2018 due to the federal tax law changes and creating a small windfall for the city at that time. The concern about this was so great that the mayor cited it as a major reason why he called for the PEG program for the first year, which we adopted this year, which you all put forward this year. But now we're at the point where we can see pit, collect pit collections from April, when most people have filed returns, their tax returns, and we get a good sense of how the year will end up uh, for this personal uh, income tax. And it looks very good. The numbers are encouraging. In fact, it looks a lot better than you might have expected when you released the executive budget only 10 days ago. At that point, uh, you raised your pit forecast for fiscal 2019 by only $284 million at that moment in time when the executive budget was released through the end of April. But we see pit collections are actually $758 million, more than OMB projected as part of the preliminary budget. In other words, there is probably $474 million more in the fiscal 2019 pit collection not reflected yet in this budget. So my question is, you see from the chart right here, uh, my question is at this point, how much do you expect to raise your pit forecast from fiscal 2019 to when we adopt the budget a little more than a month or about two months from now? So. Uh I will answer the question. I think it's important to give some context. Um, even with the job growth numbers coming out, Francesco and I have had several conversations about the fact that there are still reasons to be concerned overall of the economy. As I said in the actual testimony, while growth is up in the first quarter, there's still cause for concern because consumption is making up less of that. And that gives us a reason to be cautious moving forward. In terms of personal income tax, I think what we talked about back in prelim had to do with, I'm sorry, slate. What we had to do back in the preliminary budget had to deal with the fact that we had a combination of two factors, the December volatility in the stock market that really slowed down estimated payments, but there was also an issue of timing. Um, it's a very unpredictable environment with the Trump tax cuts to understand what's happening with behavior meaning as the SALT cap was implemented, there's less of incentive for filers to file earlier. And that's exactly what happened in April and what we're seeing, which is people waited until the April to actually file their personal income tax. There's no advantage to filing earlier because of the SALT cap. And we weren't actually the only ones to experience this. We started talking to numerous states who were also experienced, for those who have personal income taxes, were also experiencing this as well. At the point in time that we locked the forecast for adoption, you, a speaker noted what our forecast is as of the executive budget, and it was early um, in the April month where personal income tax collections were continuing to come in. As we move forward from now through the adopted budget, the collections are coming in further. We'll be working with you over this course of the next couple of weeks to update our forecast. Do you all disagree with the uh, uh, chart on the screen? I do that. not disagree with the fact that there are personal income tax collections coming in higher at the point in time now of where we locked our executive budget forecast. And moving forward, we'll have an updated forecast when we adopt the budget with you. But I mean, from the information that you have, again, at Exec, you, you put in uh, 284 on the pit. We are projecting at this point, just from the numbers that we saw for the rest of the month, up to 758. Do you all disagree with that number? Do you think the number is inaccurate or off at this point? I, you know, as it relates to your forecast, we would say we don't see that level coming in. The actual collections, you know, to date, I don't have that number on me, but. Got it. Francesco was telling me that the actual 758 is is the actual collection year to date, that there are a number of different components to it, including refunds that can come in and out. And I apologize, I thought you were asking me it's about okay. moving forward. Okay. 
So uh, there's not a fundamental. I mean, the, the number there is no to, difference. You, you have to dig down a little bit more into the specifics of that 758. But there's a agreement that that's where we are as of yes. as of today. Okay, great. So um, I know one of the issues that we spoke about, even with the the pit collections coming in higher than projected, was the unincorporated business tax collections fell. Uh, they did not come in as strong as we wanted, uh, which could be uh, potentially a small offset on higher pit collections, but lower UBT collections. Do you have any projections at this point on unincorporated business taxes and how far the drop has been uh, as of today? As of today? Or as of the last couple of weeks, as of April, as of whatever the latest numbers you have. So our current forecast for the plan assumes that the actual collections are down. We're taking down our forecast by 52 million. And in 20 and out, it goes down 189 million. Um, this is one of the more challenging, I think, and I, Francesca would agree with me, um, one of the more challenging taxes to forecast because there is so much volatility. You are correct that there is a number of different offsets. PIT is going up and property taxes are also going down. Um, what we're seeing there and experiencing there is a number of refunds is higher, abatements higher than anticipated. So that's also taking down overall the revenues. And does this change in pit collections give you a different sense of the city's economy than what we were projecting at the beginning of the year after the stock market volatility in December and in January when the pit numbers were down quite a bit? Has this changed your uh, overall opinion of where we are from the beginning of the year now four and a half months into the year? Well, as I said, I think you, you've, we've seen first quarter growth high and the concern there is what is actually driving that, which is not consumption. I think overall, we would say the economy is slowing, the revenues are not coming in as they had in prior years. And Speaker, we've talked about this on numerous occasions and you've questioned me as well on last year's significant one-time increase in personal income tax revenue that is not reoccurring. Um, but revenue growth is modest. One of the top recommendations, including in our budget response, was to fund salary parity and wage equity across the city's public sector workforce. We have called for pay parity within the early childhood education system for school nurses, for EMS staff at FDNY, and for public sector lawyers. We understand that adjusting wage rates across all sectors is a huge and expensive undertaking. The administration has made incredible investments in the city's workforce by setting labor contracts, agreeing to retroactive salary increases, and funding across the board increases for the human services sector. However, at the same time, the contracted workforce has been largely ignored. This contracted workforce primarily consists of women of color who provide vital public services across the human services sector. Why has the administration approached the issue of wages differently between the government workforce and the contracted workforce? And does the administration agree with the concept of equal pay for equal work? Absolutely believe with the concept of equal pay for equal work. And as you pointed out, Speaker, we have given contractual colas to the non-for-profit sector that also includes the um, attorneys as well that follow the pattern of the city's collective bargaining. And those are conversations moving forward we can continue to have with the entire sector and have a process set up through the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee where the deputy mayors meet with the nonprofit leadership and have ongoing conversations about what the priorities are of the sector. In terms of the early childhood sector, there's been very good progress over the last several days. Um, as you may recall, there was a concern around a strike there's been several meetings now where that has been called off because the sector believes that there has been movement and we're going to continue to have conversations moving forward around addressing their concerns and their actual proposals that they've presented. Uh, Kenneth, do you have anything to add on that? Um, just to reiterate that uh, when this administration came in, there hadn't been raises um, in the, the early childhood uh, contracted services since 2006. Um, after, shortly after we resolved the UFT and DC 37 contracts, we entered uh, as a mediating agent 
uh, into discussions with local 205 and, and the daycare council. The result was a, con a voluntary contract, five years in duration. That contract provided wage increases for all the employees in local 205, but specifically for the certified teachers with master's degrees over those, f over those four, five years, salaries increased by over 20% for those with bachelor's degrees and certified teachers, over 27%. So this was very significant raises, larger even than those that were given to our, our uh, city unionized sector. Thank you for that context, it's helpful. Um, what steps has OMB taken to start addressing the pay parity issues that the council called for in our preliminary budget response? Do you have an estimate on how much it would cost to bring pay parity for all city workers, both contracted and non-contracted? We do not have an estimate overall, um, but we have been working. We talked about the early childhood piece, and last plan cycle, we actually worked on the district attorneys on pay parity. We started that work with the um, from less than one year up to five years of service, and looking at aligning those salaries to that of the city's attorneys. And we still have work to do. We worked with the council on that at adoption. We still have work to do on um, parity and looking at the issues for beyond five years. I think, um, in Chair Drum, you'll recall this as well. There's just a number of things and factors we have to consider, and you know, what's happening with the overall staffing as it relates to raise the age. Um, and now we have other changes that are happening, bail reform, et cetera. So we need to look at it holistically, but very committed to doing so. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over uh, to my colleagues. One, you made a reference in, um, Director Hartog, you made a reference in your testimony. You said, uh, at the end of page two, you said, um, you talked about the, the budget reserves that we have, $5.72 uh, $5 billion in budget reserves in fiscal year 2020. Uh, one point, well, one billion dollars in general reserves, two hundred fifty million dollars in the capital stabilization reserve, four point four seven billion in the retiree health benefits trust. And last June, as you mentioned, we worked uh, for additional one hundred and twenty-five million dollars in general reserves and one hundred million dollars additionally in the RHBT. Uh, and you said we look forward to discussing next year's reserve levels with the council as we continue toward adoption. I asked you, I believe, at the preliminary budget hearing if you thought we needed additional reserves, and at that moment in time, uh, there wasn't a call for reserves. Um, and in this executive budget, we don't see a call for reserves. Does that mean that you think that there should not be reserves, additional reserves? Or is it something that you think we should have a conversation around and negotiate on what that final number should be? I just want to get a sense from you on where you think we should head on reserves as we move towards adoption. We, we, oh, <clears throat> excuse me. We believe that we have adequate levels of reserves. We also know that, and in my testimony, what I was reflecting is that this is a priority of the councils, it's a priority of the administrations. At last adoption, we did in fact um, decide jointly to add more of the reserves. Always want to have that conversation with the council in partnership moving forward about what the level of reserves should be. But at this time, yes, we do believe it's adequate. Moving forward, do we want to have the council conversation with you and the broader council about reserve levels? Absolutely. So uh, I appreciate that. I mean, the reserves is important to us. We do yes. think that we need to still to, to still keep growing the reserves, uh, given the context that I've heard um, many times, both in the hearings here at the council, as well as what the mayor said on the screen about his concern about the economy slowing down even further and us needing to tighten our belts a little bit. Given the uh, PEG program that was instituted in this budget, we think that we need to keep planning for the future. So if and when that downturn comes, it, we do not have to cut or slash core city services in a way that would adversely impact our constituents who live in neighborhoods all across the city. And so the reserves are really important to us moving forward, and we're going to continue to talk about that. I think you're going to hear uh, from uh, almost all of the members here today, both members who chair specific committees, but members who have uh, just a greater concern about the issues that we laid out in our budget response, uh, a real 
um, disappointment, and that might be a diplomatic way of putting it, and anger towards, again, none, with the exception of the bridging the gap social workers and the census, which uh, I'm not sure were gigantic wins, uh, but any of our uh, proposals that we put into the executive budget response, the preliminary budget response, uh, we saw show up in the executive budget. I think you're going to hear that today from many members, and uh, I share those concerns as I laid out in my opening testimony. Does that mean we won't continue? to communicate and work together and figure out areas that we can find out. But again, I found the, the mayor's uh, uh, briefing and response a little more than a week ago to be totally unacceptable. And I think you're going to hear that today from the membership. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Chair Drum. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let's talk a little bit about social workers. It's an issue that I brought up at the briefing with the mayor. In our fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response, the council called for the DOE to dedicate $13.75 million to hire 110 social workers for high-need schools. There are more than 700 schools that do not have full-time social workers on staff, and for those schools that do not have a social worker and guidance counselor, the rate if they do have a, a, a social worker and guidance counselor, the ratio of these support staff to students are often egregiously high. So why wasn't this included in the executive budget, especially when the administration exceeded its $750 million target in identifying cost savings, and the administration was able to add over $350 million to the DOE's executive budget? Chair, I, we hear you on the social workers and guidance counselors, and I think we've worked together very well to ensure that at least in every school we have a resource either guidance counselors, social workers, or a combination of community-based organizations that are providing a level of resource. Understood that there needs more needs to be done there. And as you know, at the um, adopted budget, we add another $2 million with the council for the Bridging the Gap program to provide for additional social workers. And as part of the $77 million that we announced that we came to an agreement to, that includes that additional $2 million to get to the full amount that's added in the current year for the Bridging the Gap program. In terms of what we could do in the executive budget, it was a very challenging budget. Yes, we did achieve overachieve our PEG target. We also had mandated cost that we just could not, we had to fund. And that included the Carter's cases. This is providing special education services to children who are in need. We also wanted to invest in providing some services, special ed in-house within our public schools. Um, with the idea that over time we can actually provide more of the services within the public school system that children need um, versus providing them outside of that system through the Carter cases. Um, and we have the charters um, that we had the challenge of the tuition um, now rising to the level of the lowest public school is the average and also the enrollment going up where we had to add those costs in. So this was just a matter of and all of the basic operations that I talked about that we had to add IT needs and NYPD. There's always room to have conversation moving forward. I think just to address your question about the executive budget, that was the challenge. Modest revenue, the need to come up with savings to fund mandated ongoing basic operations of government, and additional mandates that came down from the state. And before I just go to my next question, I forgot to announce that we were joined by council members Constantinides, Levine, Cornegy, Rodriguez, Perkins, Adams, Landa, Matteo, Moya, Menchaca and Miller and Kalos as well. Um, okay, so even with the bridging the gap social workers, uh, the council had requested more. We're grateful that you put in the additional two to bring us up to about 13.9, almost 14 million if I'm not mistaken. Um, but we still were asking for more in the bridge the gap as well. Um, and so as we go through the negotiations, we wanna continue to talk about that because we feel very much uh, that that type of support is desperately needed in our schools, especially with the number of homeless students that are attending our schools. Understood, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any type of a plan moving forward about addressing that issue? Um, other than our conversations with you around what our needs are, again, I, I emphasize the challenge that we have around where we were at the executive budget in terms of resources. But what we've done in working with uh, the council is at least make sure that there is a resource in every school and acknowledging that there is more work to do. There is definitely more work to do there. All right, so that brings me a little bit to renewal and rise schools. 
Uh, the DOE far exceeded its peg of about $104 million. Given that, why did OMB cut an additional $19 million from DOE's budget that is used to provide extended learning time in renewal and rise schools? And the mayor and the chancellor have both made prior commitments that schools would not lose services and support as the renewal program was discontinued. So can you please explain why you sure. cut that particular support? It seems to me in some ways that you're pulling out the rug from underneath these schools that desperately need that additional support. So I want to be clear up front, and I appreciate the question and the opportunity to clarify that every renewal, former renewal school that's a community school will continue to receive 100% of fair student funding. So there is no reduction in their total school budget it's 100% for fair student funding. And the community schools provide a number of different opportunities for students, including tutoring. The extended learning time, I think the Department of Education found that it was not as impactful. And in tight times where we need to make tough decisions, these were one of the things that we, as evaluating its impactfulness, decided that we could discontinue that because there were other opportunities within the community schools for students. I would disagree on that because I think the um, extended learning time was a time where you could uh, individualize instruction for those students and it seems that the loss of any support for those students in those struggling schools um, is going to have a negative effect on them. So uh, there is extended learning time supported one hour of after school programming um, and as I said there's other uh, academic opportunities that are offered through the community schools and the fact that they have their 100% fair student funding. And that includes academic clubs and the before school, and then there's the summer school component. So, so the well. one hour of support, in, you, did you say it was in community schools? In after school programming. For the, for the, for the renewal and the rise schools? I'm sorry, could I, could I clarify? The, the 19 million was for the one hour, but they could have more hours on top of that. Okay. All right, we're gonna talk more about that as we go through the negotiations, I'm sure, as well. Uh, at the preliminary budget hearing, um, I requested that OMB provide an estimate of how much violence in jails has cost the city between lawsuits, medical costs, overtime, et cetera. In your response to a follow-up letter after the hearing, you noted that the violence is not getting worse, uh, but it did uh, that you noted that the violence is not getting worse, but it did not provide a cost estimate of the violence. Since the last hearing, two reports have been published contesting that assertion. On March 4, 2019, DOI sent Commissioner Braun a memo alleging that the Department of Correction underreported the number of inmate fights by more than 1,000 over a three-month period in 2018. On April 18, 2019, Southern District of New York Federal Monitors published its seventh report on the Department of Correction, and in the 256-page report, Federal monitors conclude that while the use of force rates have dropped in select jails, the overall use of force is 79% higher in 2018 compared to when monitoring began in 2016. And then today I hear um, disturbing reports of corrections officers being arrested on charges of violating the uh, rights of um, visitors to Rikers Island by um, illegal searches. So what's happening there? Um, so we have, as you um, pointed out in the letter that we pr provided you in response, have invested more than $200 million to address jail violence. We've seen certain indicators that show that there's actually a decline. Slashings and stabbings have declined by 21% overall. There have been uh, numerous conversations that I've had in the most recent weeks with the commissioner. Um, who has expressed some additional needs that we would be discussing with her and reflecting in future plans to address those concerns moving forward. Okay, so in the letter you did say that you um, spent 205 million in investments um, to reduce violence in the jails. So given uh, what we're now learning about the higher levels of violence in jails, do you think those efforts are paying off? Have they worked and do, um, you have plans to reassess the effectiveness of the money already spent. We do believe that they've actually had an impact. As I said, one of the indicators that we looked at is um, slabbing, uh, stabbings and slashings, excuse me, are down by 21%. So we do believe they're impactful. Is there more that we can do? That's the question that I'm assessing as we speak. 
So will you now commit to assessing the cost of violence in the jails? Yes, I think we've been working on it um, since you last asked us for it. We, we're working on it, yes. Okay, in the budget response, the council called for supplemental budget reporting, particularly for programs and initiatives uh, that exist outside of the traditional budget reporting structure and apart from our request for additional units of appropriation. Examples of these areas include Vision Zero, Thrive, the Ferry System, and the New York School Supportive Services for the custodians in the schools. Um, in addition, we are continuing to request transparent uh, reporting for areas where the budget is particularly opaque, such as in the DHS shelter uh, funding uh, budget. Um, will you um, commit to providing the supplemental reporting that the council requested in the budget response? So I, I appreciate the question and the, we're always looking to be as transparent as we possibly can without disrupting the actual agency services. It's why we've worked over the last several weeks on the request by the council to add more units of appropriation. And as we announced today, we are looking at 34 um, as of now and working to do more as we can. The supplemental reports, I'm happy to sit down with Latanya and her staff and go through the reports and what's needed um, and whatever we can provide in terms of transparency that helps the council gain greater visibility into our budget and the financing of the city, we're happy to do that, absolutely. So with Thrive and I think with the ferry system as well, a, unit, a, a, a units of appropriation don't necessarily show us exactly where the money's coming from because it's across so many agencies. How can you give us better um, uh, transparency on that within the different agencies? Uh, I believe that's what you're asking for in the supplemental reports, and that's what I'm saying. We're, we're happy to sit down and provide that level of information and give you the transparency, the insight that you need into the actual budget and spending. Okay, um, Fair Futures. <clears throat> A coalition of over 80 foster care and children's groups is pushing for Fair Futures comprehensive supports for foster youth from middle school to age 26. Foster care providers say that one in five foster youth enter a homeless shelter within three years of aging out of foster care. Given the high cost of sheltering adults and individuals, do you think an investment in fair futures would provide savings to the city in the out years, perhaps even savings that exceed the cost of implementing the program? Understand the concept on the financing side. Um, we haven't actually run the numbers, and so we will do that. But I think more importantly, the idea that we can provide services to youth that prevents them from entering the shelter system is one that we should absolutely consider moving forward, um, aside from the cost. It is a good policy and program priority to have. So, you know, we uh, included uh, this in our budget response, and uh, we did ask for um, a consideration of what the cost would be. So hopefully moving forward, we can take yes. a closer look at that. And as you can see up here on the screen, these are some of the, um, the, the priorities that we have moving forward. Okay. Yes. Good, I'm gonna um, turn it over to um, my co-chair, Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Thank you, thank you, Chair Drum and Speaker Johnson. And thank you once again for being here and <clears throat> Before I get to the capital specific questions, um, I just wanted to uh, echo the sentiments of something expressed by the speaker when he was talking about uh, the PIT, uh, the personal income tax. And while I know uh, we projected about 284 million in revenue, um, and then the April numbers are much higher than we projected, you talked about a series of uncertainties and certain things that we have to do, mandated costs, understanding cost shifts from Albany, but um, I didn't get a clear answer uh, on the speaker's question in terms of the fact that we should have some idea of how much additional revenue that we believe we'll be able to use in this conversation of this executive budget process. So the number that we came up with was $474 million, and you acknowledge that you believe the revenue to date is about $758 million. So do you agree with our number of $474 million? And if not, do you have an idea of what we potentially could be looking at uh, in terms of additional revenue? 
So there are a number of pluses and minuses within the executive budget forecast, and at any point in time, I'm happy to have myself and Francesco sit down with the council and brief you on the different components of the forecast and the different taxes. So as I mentioned, property tax is down 70 million in the current year, mm -hmm. um, and we talked about the fact that abatements, um, refunds are up. PIT is up 284. Uh, the uh, business taxes, 60 million, 11 million positive. UBT down 52 million. Sales is a positive 18. Um, the RPTT is 30 million down. MRT, the mortgage um, reporting tax is down 24 million. So there's a number of different pluses and minuses. I can go through them all, but the, the net effect on our total taxes and the ad was about 200 million. So there's, yes, there is increase in personal income tax, but there's also decreases in other taxes. Okay, so would it be a fair statement to say that we do project that we will have additional revenue that we can use during this process to discuss a number of the budget priorities that we included in our budget response, as well as finishing up our one shots to get to 155 million. Would that be a correct assumption to say that we do have additional revenue that we can use to negotiate during this process to ensure that our collective priorities are addressed? It is a uh clear indication that in the current year for personal income tax, at the point in which we've locked the executive budget, that there are collections higher than where we Projected. forecast right. in the current year. As it relates to an overall forecast, I wanted to be clear, and that's why I mentioned all the different pluses and minuses, because a number of different ups and downs happen from now until the next forecast at the adopted budget, including certain risks, property taxes going down. On a base of, you know, over 27 billion, that's not, 70 million is not a significant decline, but it is a decline that affects how much overall revenue that we can add within any given adopted budget. I'm committed to working with the council from now until the adopted budget to not only look at if in fact as collections come in, what our revenue forecast would be, but also the council's on savings ideas. There's okay. much of the savings ideas that the council put forward in the preliminary response and to our budget. And as the speaker pointed out, we did in fact mutually agree on a number. There's more that we can do and I want to work with the council on that as well. Okay. But we do have modest revenue growth. It is okay. not at the level that we saw in fiscal year 18 of personal right. income tax. Okay, no, I understand. I appreciate that. I'm taking that as a yes. That's a yes. Okay. Um, during our preliminary budget hearings, uh, the City Council called on the administration to truly, as I mentioned before, make the 10-year capital strategy a real 10-year plan um, and not leaving the second half completely either flat or going down uh, minimally. Um, what we are asking for is in this plan, $116.9 million, it's about 72% of the spending is in the first five years with the remaining 28 in the latter five years. And so what we've continued to ask, and I ask once again, is do you believe that this strategy is a true assessment of capital investment needs over 10 years, not five years, but 10, or is it just an extension of the capital commitment plan? And if it's only an extension of the capital commitment plan, honestly, what is the point of producing a 10-year plan that's not reflective of full 10 years? So would you be able to elaborate a little bit on that? The 10-year plan reflects the 10-year commitment overall. I think the challenge is, and you have acknowledged this and we've been working on it, is that the capital plan for the first five years is in fact front-loaded. And we've been working on reforecasting right. and redistributing. And in this plan, we did multiple years instead of just one year in terms of cascading out. I think it's important to note if you look at 2018, that was our banner year in terms of spending on the capital plan of 12 billion. 2019, as of this plan, I know it's a little hard to see on the, your chart, but I believe your chart reflects our numbers. 2019 is at 16.4, 2020 is at 18.4, 21 is at 16.2, 23 is at 18.3. So if you look at 12 billion against 16.4, for instance, in 2019, we have more work to do with actually reflecting the plan as the spending and the commitments will actually occur. And so as we move forward, we'll start to see the leveling out of the plan. Okay, so from and pre- it's a challenge that you right. know we've been working on, appreciate you 
continually raising this with us as a concern to actually, as much as we possibly can in each plan, do the role and cascade out appropriately where the commitments will be. Okay. Um, from prelim to exec, uh, the only changes that we saw in the capital plan was the full funding of the four borough-based jails. Um, and this council has been talking about a number of other capital commitments that we believe the administration should be looking at as it relates to school seats and acknowledging population growth in the city of New York. Uh, we've talked a little bit about ha capital and housing, um, homeless New Yorkers and some of the set-asides and the projections that we have met in terms of targets for middle income, low income, but falling short on extremely low income, doing very well in preservation, but not necessarily the targets at the lowest end of the spectrum, as well as homeless New Yorkers. So is it our expectation that we should see any more changes in the 10-year capital that would be more reflective, from our perspective, of more needs in areas like education and like housing. The only changes that we saw were the funding of the four borough-based facilities that are fully funded at $8.7 billion. So we added a, a number of different items to the capital plan between prelim and exec, and I just want to give you a highlight of a couple. Okay. Um, we added, in addition to the borough-based jails, $1.5 billion, and that breaks out roughly um, state of good repair and Department of Transportation for six bridges of 191 million. State of good repair for uh, transportation again on the reconstruction projects for 128 million. Um, street resurfacing for lane miles at 125 million for Department of Transportation. State of good repairs for Fort Totten Fire Department for 58 million. Ongoing stormwater management projects in Staten Island for 52.3 million. Uh, maintenance of city-owned waterfront assets um, for 106 million. So a number of different, I'm just giving you a couple of highlights of what additional ads were made between the preliminary and the executive. In okay. terms of your priority, um, Chair, that you've continually raised on the affordable housing front, I just want to add there's been 1.9 billion that we add in the executive budget, fiscal year 18 executive budget, to make 10,000 units more affordable. HPD has in their term sheets now 10% homeless set aside, and we're always looking for ways to increase that. And on the supportive housing front, last adoption, the speaker um, at the urging for us to really look at how we could accelerate the supportive housing plan, we accelerated that by 200 units to bring the total unit production up to 700. There is more to be done. The mayor has made that clear, and with the, um, the deputy mayor for housing and economic development coming on, Vicki Bean, He's charged Vicki and I and the Commissioner Banks with coming up with more that we can do on the affordable housing front. Are you on pace to meet those targets? Particularly for the population you're asking. Okay. Are you on pace to meet those targets that you just described in support of housing? We are on pace as far as we have 4,700 units that are financed, um, and the speaker always asks me this, 3,200 are move-in ready. And when do you expect to be complete with the remainder? That's about 1,000, a little over 1,000? Of the 4,700 that are financed? Correct. We'll get, I'll get you an answer on that. Okay, and so the reason I ask that question and bring it up is because the ads that you talked about that are DOT infrastructure road repair related are very important, but I think New Yorkers would acknowledge and would appreciate seeing some level of more priority given for people and for homeless people or for vulnerable New Yorkers that are living in shelters and on streets. If, if that was acknowledged in the executive, coupled with all the numbers that you described, um, I think that would be a good thing. Recognizing that it takes a while to build housing, and so the numbers you described are currently being financed. That doesn't mean that we're yet in construction when people are, are obviously in need of this housing today. So I guess my question is, what is the expectation that we expect in the executive budget to further accelerate our Housing New York plan and accommodate New Yorkers that are living on the streets and in shelters today beyond housing and why? 
I do not believe housing in Y is enough, and that's my personal opinion, and I want this administration to go further. And so I would have liked to see something in the executive that acknowledges that this is a priority coupled with the work that we are already doing. I'm not taking away the numbers you described, but I'm recognizing that we're doing very well in preservation, but we're not doing well for New Yorkers at the lowest end of the spectrum. That's my concern. We believe that Housing 2.0 is extremely robust. As I said, there is more work to be done. Then in the coming weeks, you will hear more from us on what more we plan to do. Okay, I hope we hear good things. Okay, I just want to, to keep pushing because it's very important to many of us that represent constituents that are living on the streets. And it seems this administration will quickly give us a shelter before we get new housing. And that is not the conversation I want to have today, nor is it the conversation I want to continue to have during this budget process. So I'm asking, and I'll keep asking, um, to make sure that we are talking about the important priorities that we know New Yorkers really care about. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, in terms of moving forward to ensure that 10-year strategies are more accurately reflected in the latter part of the 10-year plan, the measures that you're putting in place for this particular 10-year, are you looking at other reform measures that will also look at future 10-year capital strategies as well? So is there a longer-term plan beyond this 10-year capital? Do you have ideas, Chair, that you would oh, like sure. to recommend? Yes, we'll talk. Yes, we have ideas. We have ideas. I'm happy to have the conversation. Okay. I think you've been a wonderful partner um, in both pushing us on the cascading out, greater transparency, and the tracking system, which we really want to put in place, and we got the Mayor's Office of Operations involved. If there's more that we can do to um, better reflect the 10-year planning before we get to the next 10-year, I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Okay, so you've acknowledged, I've talked a little bit about the capital project detail data, mm -hmm. and now it's available online, which we're grateful for. I think it's a good start. Understanding that this is a long-term process that we are embarking on, um, but I also think that there are short-term goals that we can look to do as well as long-term goals. Agreed. And our recent conversations, we've seen not just it being online, but we've talked about having an actual tracking system that can look at, ca at tracking capital projects projects that are not just at the $25 million threshold, but also many of our capital projects that we fund collectively in the council that are far less than $25 million. Uh, recognizing that New Yorkers, our constituents, care about the playground and the park and the library, um, which are a few million compared to the $25 million threshold. So I wanted to ask, what quality control measures do we have in place that can make sure that the information that agencies are gathering is reflected in this tracking system accurately, but also up to date and in a timely fashion to provide any improvements to the overall process that we can make going forward. So during prelim, I had a slide that was shown and it was a particular general FDNY project yeah. and there were a couple of blank lines uh, that should have been filled in. So my question is, what is OMB doing to make sure that agencies are providing accurate, timely information so that the tracking system that's online is most up to date for New Yorkers? So three times a year, we update our commitment plan. And in updating our commitment plan, we update the project detail report. This last go around, we took the council's um, suggestion and we worked closer with the agencies and, and uh, tried to get them to comply with filling out every single tracking form. And I think your staff, the council finance staff, looked at that and showed that we in fact had a very, very high compliance rate. And when we met with you personally, we showed you some of those details that laid out design, uh, construction, construction management, completion, and so forth. And it is our intent as we go forward to, to uh, even strengthen this process so that those project milestones and details are uh, helpful to everyone. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, we look forward to working with you more on that and certainly want to thank Councilmember Lander for his leadership as well. I just have a quick question on the borough based facilities. Um, and we acknowledge the council called for a full funding of the four borough based facilities at $8.75 billion. Um, but it's all in one budget line. Um, so I wanted to ask could we get some specifics on details of how much each borough will get? Does that include some of the community amenities that we know each borough has been asking for? Uh, do you have an idea of how we arrived at this particular number? And is it possible that through this process we could get more of a specific budget line? So we arrived at the overall number um, based on what we know at the present time about the scale of the buildings coming down as well as the overall projection of the census, which is lower than we anticipated um, when we started the process because of the most recently enacted bail reform. I think the challenge for getting any further granular detail at this point is that we are still going through the ULR process which will not be completed until the fall, which also includes the um, points that you brought up, Chair, regarding the additional community amenities. So at that point in time in the fall, when we have a better sense of where we are overall through the ULR process, we'll be able to further delineate the actual costs per each of the jails. And I'm assuming that that will change to some extent as you go through the ULIP process and you're engaging, and we have been engaging with the community, more engagement happens, that the, the plan will change. But we felt and wanted to be responsive not only to the council, but the fact that we have the 10-year plan and the window open to reflect as much as possible what we could around the estimated cost at this point in time. And what about community amenities? At this point in time, we're still, as I said, going through the Euler process. As we close that down and we have a better sense of what those are, we would then update the capital plan, both for any changes through the Euler process to the scope of the project, the um, actual facilities themselves, as well as the community amenities. Okay, thank you. I'll turn this back over to Chair Drum and all of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're now going to go to questions from council members. First up is council member uh, Jimmy Van Bramer, followed by Mark Traeger. Thank you very much, Chairs. I want to just start off by saying that I think your budget response, particularly as it relates to things that this council has cared about and fought for for decades, is disrespectful uh, to the body. I also want to say, as uh, an overview, when Donald Trump became the President of the United States of America, one of the first things that he did was to completely propose eliminating funding for uh, the National Endowment for the Arts, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Institute for Museum and Library Services. So given where we're at, and given the numbers that we saw with the increase in PIT, I think it's shocking that this mayor is proposing uh, reductions to cultural organizations, institutions, and libraries. Downright cruel to say that children uh, visit the New York Public Library should have fewer educational DVDs, uh, uh, given what we're facing here. And I've been with the mayor himself I've watched him speak at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where some of his commissioners will be tonight, uh, and talk about the importance of culture. But I've also been with the mayor and with Chair Gibson uh, at the Bronx Museum of the Arts and heard the mayor talk about the importance of some of our smaller cultural organizations in the outer boroughs, those that serve immigrants and public housing residents, homeless children, the formerly incarcerated. It is not acceptable to make reductions to the over 900 cultural organizations, many of them small, many of them out of borough, uh, many of them serving people of color. So my question uh, to you is, do you believe that this administration, and not <clears throat> you per se, personally, Director Hartzog, but the mayor of the city of New York, do you believe that culture and the arts is important in driving tourists to the city and billions of dollars in revenue for the city of New York? Absolutely. So why are you, not you per se, but the mayor of the city of New York, cutting the budget, right? There's a big event at the Met Museum tonight, you might have heard about it, uh, and yet we see uh, the largest reduction to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, I realize they have a large budget, but. You knew that I was going to say that. Yes, <clears throat> that's why I answered it for you. But <laughs> we cannot be reducing. What's shocking about this document and so unacceptable is that in one swell foot, uh, one, one, uh, one big uh, uh, cut here, thank you, Mark, 
Uh, the mayor is cutting the largest cultural organizations, right, that are really important in driving tourists and billions in revenue, which you yourself know is coming into the city's coffers. The Museum of Natural History, half a million children in the city of New York visit every year for free. And you're proposing huge cuts to them. But then you're also whacking the smallest of small, Ayazamana dance, folk dance center in Queens. All of that in one fell swoop. Why would you do that if this mayor believes in culture and the arts? It is a fundamentally progressive thing to do to fund the arts, culture, and libraries. Cultural, for, let me start with culturals and then I'll take libraries. So cultural's overall target was a little over six million. And I think we worked very hard with the commissioner and his team to come up with a savings plan that meets their peg target that it, while it does have reductions, those reductions are relatively modest. They're, so if you were to look, I, I, I hear you and I know that we're gonna agree to disagree, but I'd like to be able to explain the sure. rationale that if you look overall at where we are in terms of the total reduction, 2.85 million off of a base of $139 million that we give to cultural institutions. As it relates to the specific, specific peg that you're concerned about, council member, in the past, administrations have cut just across the board without taking into any consideration the size of the overall institution. That is not what we did here. We actually took into consideration the size of the institution so that the cut looked at their overall budget, and I understand we're going to again agree to disagree, but saying to the smaller institutions, we're looking at a minimum of 1,300 versus the Met at 180,000 for a budget of 139 million is the Met's total budget. So there was consideration taken, and in fact, we were looking at overall subsidy that we give to MET, and we're able to identify about a million dollars in expense dollars that we could actually um, put up as capital. And so there was no reduction. Right. We worked very hard on that front. I, I would just argue. On the libraries, but I just want yeah, to yeah, yeah. piece out. We had several meetings with the libraries, and our main goal with the libraries was not to reduce hours of service. We know the council's priority in terms of the hours of service. We believe that as well. And we actually had conversations where the libraries told us that they had taken efficiencies of their own. They'd taken down staff lines. They were doing more with less, just like we are in the city. And so we actually said, you know what? Their savings related to um, centralized um, pension and health care costs that we budget centrally. We wanted to give them actually the credit for taking on their own efficiencies prior to us even coming up with a peg target. So there's a number of different things that we did to mitigate what the impacts are. And again, I'm not disputing the fact that there is a reduction, that there is going to be a service reduction on the cultural side, and that those Well, there isn't if the city council and, and the mayor agree not to do that. And it's shocking that you are still saying at this hearing that there will be service reductions to cultural organizations when you yourself just said that billions of dollars in revenue flow to this city's coffers, which allow the city of New York to pay for all of the other services. And that's the Met, that's the Museum of Natural History, but it's also those smaller outer borough cultural organizations. Don't and yet you're still I said proposing. Billions of dollars flow as a result. I think that they are a, a very important component of the city's infrastructure. Very much believe in it. We've made investments there. So don't yes, cut it. We had to make don't those reductions. Don't cut it. And well, I'm not I'm just, just talking to you. I'm talking to the mayor of the city of New York. We cannot your position, be council the progressive bastion that we claim to be and then whack small cultural organizations that serve immigrant populations all over the city of New York. It's absolutely unacceptable. It's against our values. Councilmember Member, I just want to uh, interject and say that I 100% agree with you. And I think that this uh, is fundamentally. Uh, a progressive issue and an issue about uh, gaining access for all communities across the city. And we actually called for a greater investment in libraries and in cultural institutions in our uh, budget response. So um, for me, and I think there's near unanimity in the council, any peg cuts to these important vital institutions, I think we would call dead on arrival. Thank you, and I know my time is up. Uh, I want to thank the chairs. Uh, I just want to say also we have, as you know, a situation with the retirement system for our cultural institutions that has created an awful lot of instability. And so to propose these cuts on top of 
that instability uh, is uh, really rubbing salt in the wound. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how we're going to uh, stabilize uh, the system and, and make sure that these cultural organizations aren't taking uh, another huge hit and then destabilizing the retirement system, because I know the mayor has spoken so much about the retirement benefits uh, and how much he believes those are important to maintain. Right. <clears throat> Just to speak briefly about the current situation in CIRS. Uh, their plan is an accurately funded plan under ERISA. Uh, as such, it's reviewed by an independent actuary for soundness each year. The, I'm happy to say that the last actuary report shows that the cultural institution uh, retirement system plan is well funded. It is as they classify it under a green, yellow, red um, sort of scoring that is green not only in the current year, but green it, it, it throughout, I think it's a five-year forecast period. Um, we've been, you know, in discussions with uh, both the cultural institutions and DC 37 uh, have said the same thing I just said to you and said that, you know, should there be a time when, when the, the plan is, is not in that condition that we would meet and discuss what to do? Okay, thank you. We're going to move on to our next uh, council members, Council Member Traeger, followed by Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, the chairs and speaker. Good morning, Director Herzog. Um, you know, I, I just want to open up very briefly by saying I, I'm having a difficult time trying to reconcile the language uh, and the vocabulary being used today. Uh, I, I've heard you more than once refer to the budget uh, circumstances as challenging. In normal circumstances, when cities are sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars of additional revenue, I wouldn't define that as challenging, I would define that as promising. And so we have just heard, and you've acknowledged, which I appreciate, that there are hundreds of millions of dollars in additional personal income tax revenue that's come in unexpectedly, yes. quote unquote, right. into the city budget. Yes. But the city administration is referring to this time as challenging. No, this is promising. And speaking of promising, the, the, the mayor promised this big campaign on schools, not jails. Schools, not jails. Let's see how our schools are faring, Director Herzog. We don't see, as far as our, uh, bur uh, our budget response, $89 million for pay parity for early childhood educators, which, by the way, just for, for the public to understand, 60% of the uh, services provided by UPK are done by CBO providers. They are at the brink of financial ruin because they cannot keep up with cost. And so the administration is looking to expand 3K when UPK right now is really being threatened uh, in, terms of, in terms of its finances and we're losing people constantly in our, in our CBO uh, community. There's not one dime not one dime proposed in this budget for a fair student funding increases. And just to put that into context, the city administration leaves it to school budgets to pay for salaries of staff. And there have been contract negotiations and contract adv advancements. So schools have to pay for higher salaries for teachers, counselors, social workers, and all the key staff titles. If you don't increase the school budgets, Key folks will be accessed from those schools. So if you are a brand new special education teacher that was hired to better meet the needs of your students, you most likely will be accessed. If you are a new social worker that was hired to meet the needs of your kids, you are most likely to be accessed because we have a last in, first out system when it comes to, to our school budgets. And I, let me go on. The chair talked about $13.75 million for 110 additional social workers. Director, I visit schools as much as I can. It's during budget, it's very hard right now, but our schools are pleading with us to hire additional social workers, pleading with us. They don't need the school mental health consultants uh, that are not licensed social workers. They need direct services provided in the schools. We also don't see $11 million for the mental health continuum, services for students with significant mental health needs to provide them with mental and behavioral supports. And as the chair noted before, there are over 700 schools that don't have one dedicated social worker. I'm not sure what the term resource means, respectfully. They're looking for a social worker to be housed in their schools. No funding for Title IX coordinators. We just had a hearing that was painful to, to, to experience where some folks aren't even sure what that meant. 
but we're seeing increases in cases of sexual assault and violence committed against our students and staff in, in our school system. No funds for busing for kids in foster care. No funds to baseline teacher's choice, which covers key materials, day-to-day -day operations for classrooms. How can you say that this is a schools, not jails budget, when quite frankly, we have failed we have failed our school. So I, I'd like for you to respond initially, because I do have, I know my time has run out, just a quick follow-up. Let's first talk about the revenues, because I want to be really clear. The council and the speaker questioned me overall and personal income taxes. The entire revenue forecast is not based on solely personal income tax revenues. As I responded to Chair Gibson, there are a number of negatives and a number of positives that happen within the forecast, and the net effect of that in the executive budget is adding $200 million. So while I'm acknowledging that collections for personal income tax are coming in, there's also a number of different revenues that are going down that the offset we'll have to see as we move forward with the adopted budget will be reflected in that forecast. As it relates to our education investments in the executive budget, I explained earlier that we had significant challenges. As I'm sure you know, council member, we have no choice but to fund charter schools. It's mandated by the state. Those tuition payments have increased and the number of students enrolled increased. That brings our total spending on charter schools to a little over $2 billion annually. There is no choice but to fund them. That is what we had to do in the executive budget to reflect both the number of schools increasing and the tuition increasing. And the second biggest investment that we had to make, which is the Carter's cases, we made that investment, 100 million and 20. We also made the investment of over $33 million for special education to build that, uh, continue to build on our infrastructure of special education services within the public school system with the goal of ultimately over time being able to provide more special ed services in-house. As I said on the guidance counselors, I did not say resources, I said there's a combination of community-based organizations, guidance counselors, and social workers. Uh, respectfully, I know my, my time has run out. I, I just wanna, I acknowledge, and I, I acknowledge the fact that Albany and their budget failed our school system. No one should be taking a victory lap in Albany based on our education budget. It is, it is disgraceful uh, what those numbers look like, but respectfully, when the mayor went up to Albany a number of times, the key focus areas for him this year was mayoral accountability or mayoral, mayoral control and specialized high schools. So and I didn't really to see a sense of urgency. Significant. That cut would have been over $300 million if it had been enacted. And so that would have meant we would have to redirect $150 million of existing school aid to a certain a portion of our schools, as well as an overall cut in school aid. Right. I'm and we not, were able to avoid that, but we still had a $25 million right. cut. I'm not discussing that their... That is exactly what the mayor talked about. Right. I'm not Albany. discussing the governor's... And he did ask for fair student funding. It's to get to 100%. It's over $750 million, and we'd always talk about the need to get there with additional state support. Respectfully, I don't think the mayor effectively organized and prioritized school, school budgets uh, up in Albany this year. Uh, but we have to right this wrongs now, especially in light of the fact that there's hundreds of millions of dollars of additional re re revenue in our city budget. This is not acceptable. The budget, as we've heard, is a reflection of our values. We value schools, we value our children. The mayor is now going across the country talking about UPK. The stability of the system is at risk. I don't know even how the administration could even think about advancing 3K when UPK is at the brink of financial collapse because they cannot hold on to educators. So I'm gonna have additional follow-up questions, but Mr. Chairs, Mr. Speaker, we have a lot of work to do. I am deeply disappointed in this education budget. This, this, this is the beginning of the process. This is not the end. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger. Councilmember Rosenthal, followed by Grudenchik. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Director Hudsad. Great to see you. I really want to pick up on a comment you made uh, earlier, uh, I think, to Speaker Johnson when you said that the deputy mayors are meeting regularly with the nonprofit resiliency sector um, working group. And what you said is that um, they're meeting with them regularly and hearing their concerns. That is true. So now let's say the second part of the sentence. What they're not doing is responding to those concerns. 
at each one of those meetings, the uh, executive directors of the nonprofit organizations that are serving our New Yorkers, that are doing the work of the city, they are begging for money. They are begging for funding for inflation, for the cost of personnel. As, as uh, Council Member Traeger has pointed out, their personnel are leaving our CBOs in droves because they can get better funded jobs elsewhere, thereby hindering our ability to provide services to New Yorkers. So what the nonprofit service, uh, the, the nonprofit executive directors are telling me is that yes, they raise those concerns at those meetings. And then the deputy mayor says, no, and by the way, we have a PEG program and you're gonna have to eat the cuts. So there's a real disconnect between the mayor saying that they have a working group and the executive directors that are telling me the working group is not getting to the solutions. Um, and let me point out one simple way that the city could be funding our nonprofit sector, and that is the uh, inflation adjustment reserve. So we have a reserve for contract inflation. Why have we never dipped into that reserve to pay for inflation in our human service contract budgets? And I've looked back now over the last five years, so during the de Blasio administration, and what I'm seeing is that every year that reserve is simply emptied out and taken as, uh, I think it's called in the budget, procurement savings. And at the same time, the nonprofit executive directors are begging to, that the city cover the costs of inflation. So what's, what's going on with all the disconnects there? We seem to have this conversation, I think, routinely, and maybe it's time for us to have a meeting with you and I, with the deputy mayor, to really get to the bottom of this. I think my position has been very clear on this. We have made significant investments. Having gone from 150 the time, million over on, time, yes, and I, I every wanna, time at the budget meeting with the mayor, I thank him for the 150 that is because more the than, prior no, no, no. 20 We've years we have that. starved these organizations. 150 million is a lot. They need 250 million more You're only just at to what be we did able to adoption. provide services. We have done model budgets for the preventive programs. We've done model budgets for senior centers. There's more to do on that front. We have done model budgets for homeless shelter providers, and I personally worked on the indirect rate increase that we did. Yes, the, first the thing indirect that we did, cost, they can now calculate their cost. Remember, we it won't be it funded, all. but they can calculate we the cost. We funded 10%, and in fact, when yes, we you're at 10%. The actual I cost is 17%. I can't answer your question if you don't let me finish speaking. I'm trying to answer the question. We funded 10%, and originally what we did was say we're going to phase it in over time. The nonprofits came back to me and said, we want this funding now, fully annualized at $110 million. And we said, yes. Mm -hmm. So there have been years, more than decades, where the nonprofit 20. sector did not get that, not and we bupkis. were able to do it. Not bupkis. Can't do it all, though. OK, so we're going to agree to disagree on yes, that. And lastly, you have in the budget procurement reform savings yep. from fiscal year 18. And the current year, fiscal year 19, was expected $20 million in savings. I would imagine that would come out of individual agency budgets, or I don't know where that comes. But you have $20 million that you took out of fiscal year 19 and 30 million expected from next year. Where, what budgets did those actually come out of when you have passport savings? It's our expectation that those savings uh, <clears throat> will be the result of the successful implementation of our yes. first auction. Yes, how is it implemented in the budget? We have, <clears throat> we've taken savings um, centrally 
and are expecting once we roll out uh, the uh, reverse auctions that we'll see savings in the various agency budgets uh, as they procure items through that process. Right, it's just so, that it has to be effectuated in a budget. <clears throat> and I'm just wondering, since fiscal year 19, you have exact now, where was that 20 million effectuated? What agencies, how was that 20 million effectuated from a central goal mm -hmm. of 20 million to? Yeah, we'll get back to you with the, the layout of where, where the agency spending was reduced. Sorry? We'll get back to you with, with the layout of where the agency spending was reduced. Oh, I would really like to see that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Gudenchik, followed by Rivera. Thank you, Chair Drum. I think it's still morning. Good morning, Director Hartzog. Um, as Parks Chair, I have got to raise my voice. Um, the Parks budget continues to go sideways and, and actually is deteriorating as a percentage of the overall New York City budget. Um, over the past year, I visited about 100 parks. Our parks are in pretty decent shape, but they're not gonna continue to be, and they could be in much better shape um, with more money. And I'm not talking about hundreds of millions of dollars in investment. I'm talking about much more mo modest and targeted investments that we need to make for our park system. Um, we cannot depend upon the private sector forever. They are, uh, have been and will continue to be quite magnanimous. But uh, for millions of New Yorkers, the parks are the only vacations they get. And you've heard from my colleague, uh, colleagues this morning uh, about our progressive values, and we need to move forward on that parks budget. Um, hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers have joined in this quest, and I will continue to push for that over the next month or so. I also want to add my voice um, to Chair Drum and Chair Traeger uh, about fair student funding. Um, and about funding overall for renewal schools. Uh, Martin Van Buren High School, which is in my district, is the only renewal school I have. We've made tremendous progress there, uh, so much so that the mayor visited for a town hall um, in the fall of 17. I am worried that the progress that we've made there, where we've turned around graduation rate from 45% to almost 80% in just six years will be eroded. So I'll be calling you if I get complaints from the school community, okay? Is that fair? Okay. Lastly, um, I don't have any waterfront, and I don't have any ferries. So unless I build a canal to my district, which I really don't want to do, um, I am asking this administration to seriously consider uh, one, one card, Metro card swipe for people who use the Long Island Railroad and Metro North in New York City. This would be an absolute game changer. The people out in Eastern Queens cannot wait 20 or 30 years for a subway to be built. We need access at a fair rate. I know that uh, Councilwoman Adams will tell you what a game changer that would be for the 6,000 plus families that live at Rochdale Village and so on and so forth. So as we go forward uh, during the rest of this uh, mayoral administration, I'm gonna continue to press this I'm told it's about a 50 or $60 million investment, but we need to do that um, now. And I thank you. I don't have any questions, but we will be talking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Grudenchik. Council Member Rivera, followed by Levine. Thank you so much. I'll take Barry's time. <clears throat> I thank you so much for being here. Uh, good morning. Um, I just want to, you know, of course, stress and underline everything my colleagues have said. We come together, we meet in committee, we have thoughtful conversations about the budget. People poured hours and hours into our response because we take this so, so seriously. And we want to be thoughtful and we delivered a balanced budget. So to see the savings that we described be served back to us almost as your own idea and then for our ideas and and what we know is critical to the foundation of a strong new york economy that serves everyone that that was it was disturbing and it was offensive so i have to let that just let that um be known because when nycha senior centers are threatened and fully funding bridging the gap is in question I feel like they're low-hanging fruit for us to feel good about when we win them in budget negotiations. And I feel like that's unnecessary and a waste of everyone's energy. So um, I also want to stress 
cross-agency transparency, because a lot of the agencies work together to fund programs, and sometimes we don't have all the information to know where the money is coming from and where it is going. Having said all that, speaking of transparency, the first question is about H&H. &H. We've had some issues over the years on transparency. Why couldn't H&H &H turn in an executive budget when they could a preliminary one? And I say that because Dr. Katz recently made some comments about if DISH cuts came to New York City, H&H &H facilities would be in jeopardy, and I'm wondering why financially this isn't so urgent that we have to prepare when a federal government is no friend to New York. I believe you're asking for the H&H &H cash plan for the executive budget. Um, we are in the process of updating it, and I believe my staff is meeting with you tomorrow to go through it and all the different components of it and what our assumptions are um, as it relates to the cash plan on the dish um, reduction, which from a cash plan basis, we have to actually prepare as, as though that's not going to happen, meaning that we're not going to get dish cuts delayed. Um, has it been delayed in the past? Yes, it has, at least four times. Hopeful that that can happen again, but obviously from a financial management, a good responsible planning perspective, we can't assume that that's going to happen. Thank you. But we can walk you through all the components. And, and I only ask because we typically have hours or a day with what you, the documents and the information you yeah. give us, and it's not fair. I have to move on to my next question. Census money was provided, but only at half of what we requested. When this is a national competition, and I know your administration is very interested in national politics, why aren't we looking at how we fund the census when California has already allocated 100 million? This is billions of dollars on the line. So I'm asking why that money and why that amount and how much actually will go to the community-based organizations we are so reliant on to do the work in getting the numbers? The mayor and Deputy Mayor Thompson believe that the $26 million, in addition to what the state allocation will be, is sufficient for the plan to roll it out. If we move forward in implementation, given the commitment to ensure that every New Yorker is counted, both the mayor and the council consider this a priority. If we need to add an additional plan, we will add. But at this point in time, that's sufficient funding. In terms of your question about how much goes to the community-based organizations of the 26 million, it's about 8 million is for community-based organizations. There's a significant amount of funding for a robust media and communications plan. Um, and then there's additional staffing. You said 8 million? 8 million for grants. So uh, there has been a number of assessments as to how much money we need. So I understand that's your kind of you've analyzed that that's, that 26 million is, is sufficient. We, I think we all disagree with you, so we ask that you revisit that number. And just the last plug is for, for the bridge, bridge programs that are for job readiness, we really wanna make sure that that's fully funded. That, that is for people who have been historically underserved educationally and have lacked access to economic opportunity just throughout the years. And so we, we hope that you will look to increase that funding and we would like demographic breakdowns of who that program is serving. Um, and lastly, with the, with the personal income tax revenues up you know, you can fund a lot of these programs. And so I just want to say that the, the discretion that you use is astounding to me, and I know I'm new, but um, I hope that we can work together to increase that transparency. Thank you for being gracious with the time. Thank you very much. Councilman Rulli. Uh, Chair Drum, I just want to reiterate, um, again, I appreciate the, the good back and forth we're having today here with the OMB director and her staff. I just want to say, <clears throat> again, from a process perspective and from a, a working together perspective, you know, if the chair of a particular committee and the finance division of the council is not given uh, an executive budget for H and H before this hearing today, I mean that's problematic. And and I say that with uh, the utmost respect for Dr. Katz, who I think is amazing, and I am super grateful that he's in that position. He's doing an incredible job. But again, if we're having this hearing today the finance staff and the chair should receive that information before the hearing, not the day after the hearing, because we have to do work in a public setting like this and be able to ask questions. So again, it's disappointing that that didn't happen, and I don't know what the reasons are, but we want all the information before we have these hearings.
We've been in the process of updating the cash plan. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that the chair before the hearing had a full briefing along with council finance because we were providing the cash plan after the hearing, my hearing. But it will be well in advance of the H&H &H hearing and again, it will be a full briefing on all of the major changes so that the chair is fully ready for the H&H &H hearing and has the opportunity to ask my staff questions about all the changes that were made. And that is not something we normally do, but we can do that again moving forward at each time. I do apologize for the delay. And in the, the hearing point. is on Thursday? Yeah. I believe? Yes. Yeah. And I, I also just want to say that the, um, I, I, I hear you on the, the deputy mayor, Deputy Mayor Thompson and the mayor believe that the, is it $26 million is an appropriate level? Of course, we don't agree with that. I mean, all the advocates, the Hispanic Federation, name any of the groups that have been working on the census, they've said $40 million is the bare minimum that they would want more than that. So we're gonna continue to fight for the full 40 million and I wanna turn it back to you, Chair Drum. Thank you, we've been joined by Majority Leader Kumbo and uh, Council Member Deutsch. Uh, Council Member uh, Chin, uh, excuse me, Council Member Levine, followed by Council Member Chin. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And I want to reiterate the point that the speaker made earlier about stronger than expected tax receipts. So we're not talking here about spending money that doesn't exist. We're talking about spending money which does thankfully appear to come in. And with that in mind, I want to bring up a few health priorities. Uh, first, the uh, Council in its response has prioritized funding safe injection sites otherwise known as overdose prevention facilities. Uh, this is one of the biggest public health emergencies we're facing in the city with more people dying from overdose than die from homicide, suicide, and traffic crashes combined. Uh, we've lost a year in this fight, largely thanks to delays in Albany, but we wanna make sure that the resources are there to start this immediately. Why is the administration which supposedly shares this priority not yet funded safe injection sites? Sounds like on this one, we are waiting for the state um, to give us approval from the State Department of Health. But we if that approval comes that after approval. the budget, uh, the city budget's approved, then we have no money. Council Member, there's always an opportunity once we get an approval to add funding in a future plan and the agency could actually start a rollout and then we could add the funding in a future plan. Okay, I wanna move on to some other matters, but I strongly feel we should put that in the budget now. That was the council's position so that we lose no more time in a crisis which is taking one New Yorker, one fatality every seven hours. Um, a, a not well known but important stream of funding is Article 6. This comes out of the state. I asked uh, the mayor and your team about this in the briefing of, of uh, a week or so ago. Um, it really was, was reprehensible that the state cut this money only to New York. It means $59 million of a hit for programs which really affect the people who are suffering on the margins in New York City. And I asked in the hearing, uh, in, the, in the briefing about this, and, and you all said that all 59 million uh, were restored in your executive. That didn't turn out to be exactly true. The portion of that money, which is so critical, which is going to community-based nonprofits in efforts like uh, combating HIV AIDS, in efforts like combating viral hepatitis, um, is not in the executive budget. And the, the, the channel by which this passes to the CBOs is in matching funds off of council priorities. But it would mean millions of dollars lost uh, on a couple of efforts that, uh, we, in, in the case of in the epidemic, HIV AIDS, we cannot slide back on. And in the case of viral hepatitis, uh, I wouldn't even say slide back because uh, the big progress is yet to come on that fight, uh, but we don't want to be um, detracted from that critical priority either. Um, can you clarify, uh, you said all 59 million were in there, so are you gonna produce money for these uh, CBOs doing that critical work? I think it's a, a matter of when timing of when the cut takes effect. The $59 million that the, um, was included in the state enacted budget is effective July 1. So currently programs that are funded remain funded at that level. The 59 million takes effect in July 1, so that's our next city fiscal year, and that is the funding that we backfilled. Right, but we are talking about the next fiscal year. We're talking about having the resources for these fights in the next fiscal year to continue programming, which the state was funding in previous years, including the year we're currently in now. No one's talking about uh, funding for this current fiscal year. We're talking about funding for FY20, 
and right, uh, which the 59 million is backfilled including for uh, CBOs who yes. are continuing service beginning yes. in July that's correct okay I, I think we have a semantic disconnect here uh, so uh, the, the, the money that would be available for reimbursement to CBOs doing the services uh, is in fact filled. accounted for in the budget that is correct uh, you don't need an article C to uh, a, 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 a I, um, you don't need the detail that we put uh, in, in our in our city council breakdown, uh, listing the individual nonprofits for that. If you're referring to uh, ads that we made in the current year that we didn't that are not reflected in 20, that's different. I thought you were referring to with the baselining program that's in Department of Health that is funded by Article Six dollars. There is funding that we added at adoption with partnership with the council that's funded in fiscal year 19 that is not yet, that's not reflected in the fiscal year 20 budget. Um, some of that may be included in the 77 million that we most recently came to an agreement on. But if there's funding that's added, that is okay. not, I think that's uh, what I'll, I'll let this go because my time is up. The fact is, as of now, the CBOs, which are providing services and in the epidemic and viral hepatitis, will face a multi-million dollar cut for the fiscal year that starts July 1st, uh, unless we find a way to fill that gap. And uh, we, we are asking the administration to do that so that we do not slide back in these critical fights. Okay, thank you, thank Mr. you. We're going to have to take thank a five-minute break, um, so and then we'll return after that.
Yes, sir. Okay, we're going to uh, reconvene now, and we're going to start with Councilmember Chin, followed by Rodriguez. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Director. Um, and thank you for the meeting that uh, I had with your staff, and it was very productive. And, but I was very disappointed that the money for uh, senior meal, congregate good meals, and the uh, food server worker did not get into the executive budget. So I hope by the time we finalize the budget that it is included. Because I wanted to say again, that seniors are part of our future. We cannot ignore them. We help build the city. And we have to continue to invest in our senior as we invest in our young people with K3 and, and K4 senior are still part of our future. Don't ignore them. And the seniors that go to our senior center, according to DIFTA's you know, report that they did, they're healthier and stronger. So we gotta continue that investment. And in the executive budget, the way that you try to get uh, DIFTA to take the peg, because the mayor, when I asked him, he said, well, everybody has to have one. And what had happened was that you decided to close those centers at DIFTA, right? And I think in the executive budget, there's 12 of them um, that the administration is proposing to close, and that will, uh, and then get the senior to take a bus or take a van or whatever to get to other senior center close by. But a lot of these uh, social clubs are actually overutilized. 
and now we're crowding the senior centers that are already crowded, and we're not giving the senior center any more money. And when you mentioned earlier about the model budget, you know how I feel about the senior center model budget, that we didn't put enough money in there. Right, David? <laughs> um, and I'm still waiting for the money. <laughs> Because we had the meeting, um, the 10 million was put in two years ago, right? Uh, for fiscal 18, because that was the year the senior in 2017, and we were very happy at that time that you finally recognized um, the importance of senior center and 10 million was put in there. But now two years later, that budget did not get increased and there was a promise, and they said, well, we're gonna put it next year. Let's not hold it off to next year. Let's put it in this year to make sure that our senior center are supported, the meals are increased are in there because the last increase was in 2014 of 25 cents per meal. And I say that in uh, the one shot that you did add some money back for home deliver meal, but that's not enough. Uh, so I hope that before we sign on to the final budget, that that money better be in there uh, for our senior center, because I told the mayor, if it's not, I am very, very unhappy and it's unacceptable. So, director, I look forward to continue to working with you to make sure that money is put in. There is no better advocate for the senior community in New York City than you, council member. And every year is the year of the senior, thanks to your work. Um, so a couple things, and I'll try to be quick, because I know we have other questions that we want to get addressed. But <clears throat> on the um, actual uh, food redesign, we said late spring. And so we have a report that's due to you. And um, I know that we've been in conversations with DIFT on that. And so we owe it to you to have a follow-up meeting on that to circle back on where we are with that. And yes, it has been a component that we pulled out of the model budget specifically because we needed more time to take a look at it and it's now time that we actually look at that and assess where we are and what we need to do the next tranche of model budget but does that mean adding the funding in there i have i myself have not um, been briefed on the report yet and so that's i don't know what the implications are um, what we're looking at and if there's any room for right what the implementation timeline is so just like we phased in the model budgets it, we have to look at what those costs are and what the implications are and there's I'm, increase in revenue so there's no excuse saying that there's no money there's declines in revenues as well um, that are also reflected in the net effect of our forecast which was just 200 million up but committed to having that conversation with you. I want to just clarify, because I think there's been a lot of, you know, the senior clubs and the centers. So we really firmly believe when we assessed the senior clubs, the 12, that there were better opportunities within close proximity for seniors to have a full service senior center versus the clubs, as you know, that are smaller, they don't offer meals and more comprehensive planning and services because of the physical space constraints. And for these particular 12 sites, it was with the intent in mind that we can better service those seniors with full service senior centers that are very close in proximity. And we did provide the transportation within DIFTA's budget to do that. We want to work with the council on the implementation of that and the timeline. We have been out, that, not me personally, but the city in looking at these sites. And we also want to look at opportunities to better maximize the space at the NYCHA facilities. And even if that includes, as Chair Gibson has pointed out, more affordable housing within NYCHA. That's something we're open to looking at with NYCHA. And we want to make sure that there is a transition for these seniors that is reasonable, that they have time to do that. They're aware of what the services are that are being offered at the centers. We believe that the centers do not need additional funding with exception of the transportation for the services to offer, but if they do, we're more than happy to do that. And we, this is about providing a better service to those particular seniors within those 12 clubs. Well, we're gonna have an opportunity tomorrow is the executive budget hearing with DIFTA to really go into this in more detail. We do, and I look forward to having ongoing conversations with the council on implementation of this moving forward, not just in the hearings, but also details on the plans for each of those clubs and the centers that the seniors will be able to access. But according to our you know, data that we got, 
a lot of them, at least seven of these clubs are overutilized. So I'm not sure how you're defining overutilized. We did look at attendance as a factor. They tend to have lower attendance than the others. But again, that wasn't the driving factor. The factor was looking at the resources, the senior centers within close proximity and providing those seniors with but better I, think, I don't think we're looking at the other, because we have a lot of what we call NORC program where mm -hmm. they are at NYCHA mm -hmm. and they are connected to a senior center and that senior center provides the meals there and the programs there. And it's a wonderful model and it's happening all over the city, especially I know the one in my district that's working. Mm -hmm. And I think Gifton needs to look at that rather than forcing the senior to have to travel. I mean, like the reason why they like where they are at socialization and everything, that their friends are there, you can't force them to go to somewhere else. If the center was close by, they could have gone there already. So we really need to look at individual center and how to make that connection, how to make the services better, and not just say, oh, you have an option, just go to the, we'll, we'll just uh, bust you over to the, the closest center. So let's have more you know, discussion on that mm -hmm. before we start implementing it. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Rodriguez followed by Cornegy. Thank you, Chair. Look, I, I believe that there's a lot that we still have to do to increase, the, to restore the funding to the 150, 154 million dollars. I hope that conversation will continue. You guys continue negotiating with our team so that we can get there. But, you know, the 77 million is small progress, but that's not close to where I hope that we will be by the time when, led by the speaker and the mayor, the handshake take place. I feel that there's area where this administration has a lot to celebrate, police reform, education, housing, but still we also have to realize that we inherit a city, that a lot more has to be done, that probably the changes that we need will not happen even in our generation. And that is sadness of our time. That we live in two cities. That is better to go and hit the guy in the White House because we can see his color than approaching the two cities that we have here. Because we have many schools that they don't have after school elementary, after school program in the elementary, at the elementary level. It's not mandatory. It was not, it is not included in this project. I think that that's one area that I hope that we can continue working on it. I believe that when we look at housing, I have some issue on HDC. I don't know if they have all the funding to, in order to honor all the agreement related to rezonings. Because what I heard in some area, and I can tell you even in the Inwood area, there's some developers that they were supposed to be the two or three first one go deeply affordable, that they saying that now they've been told that probably there's not enough funding now for them to do and structure the big project as we agreed. And that, I don't think that that's not only in Inwood, I think that this is something that I hope that in this budget, there's enough funding to HDC to finance the affordable housing. I believe that on Vision Zero, as we have seen the data, it speaks by itself. You know, this has been one of the babies of this administration and we as a council, myself, chairing the community transportation have been very uh, grateful to be working together. But every year, for the last three years, you, the administration, have refused to put the money for the educational awareness initiative. What we have seen now at the beginning of this year is that there's an 11% increase of injuries in the city of New York. And I think that that area is another one that I hope that you guys can come back to us and be able to increase poor real dollars when it comes to the education awareness, Vision Zero initiative, so that more New Yorkers get involved. So those for me are concerned. I know that we've been trying to do the best we can, but that's, there's area that we have to tackle. The investigation is squad units. How can we double the number of men and women in charge? We only have 24 to investigate more than 40 cases of hit and run every year in the city of New York. 4,000 of those, and with individual in critical condition, and an average one person dying every year, and only 24 people are assigned the NYPD to investigate those cases. 
Okay, there was a couple different components. I th think I got them all. On the first, on the Inwood rezoning, I believe this is sufficiently funded. We should have a follow-up with you immediately after the hearing to make sure that we've addressed any concerns you have. And on the overall neighborhood development fund, um, we believe that there is adequate funding both between HDC, um, the affordable housing, as well as the NDF dollars that are existing. There is going to be more rezonings moving forward, and we will have to reassess at that point in time the level of NDF funding. Um, but for the existing, that funding is there. So any problems related to Inwood, we should follow up with you immediately on. On Vision Zero, we know that the, the Department of Transportation has done some media work within their existing budget. We think that there's an opportunity for us to go back and have a conversation in light of what you've just said and the statistics that you pointed out for us to revisit that with the agency and come back on what more needs to be done, um, particularly on that front. And on the collision staffing, this is the first time hearing of that. Um, appreciate you bringing it to my attention, the, um, the uh, NYPD collision staffing. We'll take a look at that and get back to you as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Council Member Cornegie followed by Miller. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Uh, good afternoon, Director Herzog. Um, the, so in keeping with the theme that's, that's been today, I, I got to say that the constituents of New York City have a reasonable expectation uh, that the budget is going to reflect the priorities of the city and the administration. I think that this budget has failed to do that, and in particular around MWBE. So my questions today uh, will be focused around the MWBE program. Um, even though my district holds one of the 12 senior centers and very disappointed in the idea that we would cut those. And it hap happens to be a very viable senior center, by the way, but my colleagues touched on that in a great way. Um, my two questions are around MWBE performance and MWBE lending, so I'll start with the lending. SBS administers the $10 million contract financing loan fund a revolving loan fund which provides low interest loans to MWBEs. Has this, has this been a successful program? How many MWBEs have accessed this fund over the last three years? And uh, being that this is a revolving low fu loan fund, is this something that you feel we could expand? So the city has awarded close to 12 million um, out of the loan fund for a total of 61 loans and uh, two awards. I think we would say the program's overall been successful. Is it something that we could expand? Um, and Tara's pointing out that we raised an additional $20 million in private funds, in addition to what the city has put forward for the loan fund. So for, for me, as the um, current chair of the city council's MWBE task, fo task force, um, uh, every time I speak with MWBEs, they're saying that the $10 million reflects one tiny fraction of what's actually necessary to be successful and compete in this marketplace for those contracts. So I asked you kind of facetiously, did you think you could expand it? I know that there's an expansion that's necessary. Are you willing to expand it? Should have been my question. I'm willing to have a conversation about um, what needs to, what you envision the expansion to be. Um, I think we have to have that within the context of where we are overall in the financial plan, but I'm happy to have that conversation with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so MWBE performance, in fiscal year 2018, roughly $1.1 billion was awarded to MWBEs. Now, while that sounds like a tremendous number, uh, it demonstrated little growth in the value of MWBE awards from fiscal year 2017. What efforts is OMB contributing to increase the value of MWBE awards with city agencies, if any? I think that this is a question on the participation that's best answered by Deputy Mayor Thompson um, because the work of the MWBs comes out of his office, um, encouraging agencies, including OMB, um, to participate in the MWBE program. So I'm happy to take that back and get an answer for you. Okay, last question is one, one NYC set a goal of achieving a 30% utilization rate for MWBEs by the end of fiscal year 2021. Is the city on track to achieve this goal? And what measures are the administration and agencies taking to prioritize MWBEs in city contracting? Um, I, I will get an answer for, to you on that from the deputy mayor shop. So I, I want to ask, is, is, that a, is that a meeting that you'll facilitate between myself and the deputy mayor and the task force? Or is, are you going to ask those questions and get back? I'm not trying to be, um, uh, I, I just want to yes. be direct on, on, on what, be, what will be the methodology for getting that information, because I think it's important. Of course. 
we will ask the questions and get back to you with the answers in writing, and we can um, channel that through the council finance staff, as we normally do for the hearings. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Councilmember uh, Miller, followed by Adams. Thank you, Chair, and Madam Chair, and uh, Director, thank you for being here today. I know it has not been easy and it's been long, but that's the job. So um, I want to, I wanna, uh, my questions are, are, are threefold. First, as the Chair of the Black Latino Asian Caucus, representing four and a half million New Yorkers, our theme for our budget response this year is equity. And it is difficult to be able to assess whether or not this budget is equitable, as my colleague said, in serving the most vulnerable um, and, and, and the entire city holistically if the information on the budget is kind of trickling out. And we were hoping to have an immediate response or at least uh, an intelligent response, um, but uh, without the information uh, within the budget is impossible to do so. So I hope that we can count on that information being released in its entirety and available in its entirety. Um, there are some things about equity and specifically, I'm, I'm always, uh, as uh, was mentioned about my colleague from Southeast Queens, uh, the ferry, certainly that is a, 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 a service that is not necessarily uh, equitable in how those services get delivered. It is questionable whether or not it is necessary, whether or not it's just a way of uh, providing a elitist service to a particular group of New Yorkers serving uh, Wall Street and the business area. And um, the, whether it's, that is consistent with the investment in transportation options such as fair fares, or as my colleague said, the um, uh, contributions to uh, Metro North and Long Island Railroad, which would bring, great, bring greater accessibility to many more New Yorkers. Um, so again, uh, equity. And then finally, uh, not finally, I, I'm going to put on my labor hat and, and uh, talk about the human capital and whether or not it look at the impact on the workforce, uh, considering uh, attrition and um, whether the, num and the numbers have diminished, particularly uh, mentioned in the budget was uh, the, the um, traffic enforcement and how there's intended, there, there is intentions to increase the number of fines with, at, which I don't see how to do it with less bodies. Um, so certainly that is a contention because it is um, the services that our, civil, uh, that our public servants deliver that make us safer that make us healthier, that make us more educated, that give this city value, that I hope the budget is reflecting. And then finally, as a uh, representative of the 27th Council District, 65% home ownership, um, what is in the budget to ensure that we are protecting those homeowners throughout the city, particularly those African-American uh, immigrant homeowners that depend on this opportunity to build wealth um, they are consistent taxpayers. That revenue is there. It is not reflected here. Uh, whether the only program that we've seen coming from the admin support in the past had been foreclosure prevention, which we have to get beyond that. We're asking that that be consistent because we're seeing that uh, occur throughout the city again, as well as distressed mortgage buyback and any other assistance that you have for homeowners. I'll listen. There are several different components. I want to see if I, I um, got them all. The first was you were talking a little bit about the overall workforce and where we are. On the traffic enforcement agents, we are taking down um, vacant positions, but year to year, they're actually increasing overall, which is why we're able to look at where we are with our revenue and reflect additional revenues as a result of that. So. There is a slight increase from year to year, even with the reduction, and it's based on that and looking at their total traffic enforcement and the mixture of different positions that we're able to reestimate the revenue on that front. Um, I think you asked uh, several questions about the investments that we're making overall um, for property owners. We have made investments in the green infrastructure overall in Southeast Queens. 
there are, you're right, we have made investments in various discrete programs, small programs on the floor closures front. I think there's more to say as we move forward and overall in the property tax commission that we are partnering with the council on, on what additional um, resources, supports, relief we can do, all with, and I, I would must say this, with keeping uh, revenue neutral within the process. So let me just respond by saying, sure. That is woefully insufficient. It has been in the past, considering the critical crisis that we continue to find ourselves in around uh, foreclosures. Um, I, it's certainly something that we need to be able to address and love to have a more substantive conversation about what that support looks like. And certainly respectfully disagree with your analysis of traffic enforcement. And I know you didn't touch on the other piece, but certainly, um, again, uh, equity in the budget is very important that we are serving communities and subsidizing communities greatly. At the same time, we're not subsidizing housing, but we're subsidizing um, ferry service. I, I'm not saying that. That makes sense. We've made significant investments in the MTA, and I think the most recent enacted budget is an acknowledgement that there needs to be additional resources. It's what the 12 point in the congestion pricing plan is, and that is, I think, a partnership that we have between the legislature and the governor to actually do that. And we cannot, the city, afford to finance the entirety of the MTA. The ferries in particular, the mayor has been very clear about this, which is that it is an additional source of transportation that is actually serving communities in which they are isolated from other means of transportation. And it does hit certain communities that are low income. Coney Island was one of our most recent ads. And in the Bronx, we added an additional stop um, to reach communities that are isolated. So that, that is a priority of the, the mayor. We have made those investments and we believe that they, they are effective. I, 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 just one second, if, 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 if we want to, I, I, that's probably a conversation that we, if you want to have it public, I, I'd love to engage, but certainly coming from a community that is a transportation desert, someone who lives 4.4 miles from the subway, takes the bus from the first to the last stop and a train from the first to the, la to the last stop, anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours is our commute in Southeast Queens. And, and the administration, we have asked them for the past four years to consider the uh, uh, um, investing or supporting um, commuter rail so that we can access that, that would not, would, would not just cut the commute in half, but what you can't quantify, giving people five to 10 hours a week back to their communities and families, and there have been absolutely no response, no investment, but yet, we are investing in that and Far Rockaway, the, 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 doesn't go to Far Rockaway and it has yet to go to Coney Island and it has yet to go to the Bronx. The fact of the matter is it'll end up in College Point and other communities um, before it ends up in those places there. And as I said, it is not equitable. It is not serving communities, uh, low income communities. And certainly it is not the most efficient way to deliver those services at more than $10 in subsidies. We're going to have to agree to agree on that. And, and I, I would love to, to whomever on that side thinks that that is a more efficient way to deliver services. I, I'd love to. Councilmember, I'm happy to meet with you to have a conversation about our ferry investment and what we're doing, the routes, and the benefits of those investments. I just think we are agreeing to disagree. So the interesting thing about that is, there's been numerous is, 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 as, as we as was displayed. The administration's initiatives, whether it was Vision Zero, whether it was the ferry and the others, those services that get delivered, it, it is, there's a, I think it was a hundred and 200 million, 200 and whatever million dollars towards secure bike lanes and other infrastructure and two million, 107 towards secure bike lanes and other infrastructure from DOT and two million towards secure bus lanes. Over two million people ride buses every day. How many people are riding bikes? Where's the equity? Where's the equity to, to, to those outer boroughs communities that absolutely depend on buses? Where is it? I'm not sure if you're referring to just incremental ads that we made between the two plans versus our total investment 
in the infrastructure. We're happy to get you those numbers, but I think what you're ask, adding are just incremental ads that we've made, not the full amount of funding that we have dedicated in the financial plan towards that transportation overall. Happy to provide you with those numbers. Uh, you know what? I, this is what we had the last transportation hearing. You should be able to provide those numbers now. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Council Member. Um, and I know we're running on, a, up, on, a, on one o'clock and uh, we have another hearing, so I'm gonna ask council members to make sure that they are um, short with their questions. Uh, council Member Adams followed by Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, for this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Hartzard, for being here today. I know it's a long day with us, as usual. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna, I don't wanna be redundant. But I, I also have to echo my colleagues' expressions of disappointment. Um, in the mayor's initial preliminary budget, as it yielded none of the council's recommendations, zero recommendations. So I, I'm just gonna ask just a couple of questions. Hopefully I can get them in um, and, and echo as well that the pit is stronger than expected and at least four point, uh, four, 400, um, $74 million increase in pit revenue. Um, I think that needs to be revisited when we go back to the drawing board with this, uh, with this information. But there has been a lot of interest and a lot of conversation citywide conserving Thrive NYC. And in the fiscal 2020 executive budget, the administration reduced the funding for Mental Health Service Corp, $9 million in fiscal 2019 only out of a $50 million total request from the New York City Council. However, no Thrive NYC money has been reduced in fiscal 2020. Why did the administration only reduce $9 million in Thrive NYC funding? So I, I'm going to continue to say this as the council continues to bring up PIT um, and that the collections are up is that there's an overall revenue forecast and there are taxes that are going down. And so in the executive budget, the net effect of taxes going up and down in terms of our forecast, and clearly in the current year, it's based on actual collections, was a net of 200. And so as we move into the adopted budget, we'll have conversations overall about the forecast, not just isolated Understood. on personal income tax. Understood. Um, to your question about Thrive, we, uh, there's two pieces to this. I think the 50 million was looking at where spending has been. Um, we believe that Thrive and with the right sizing of the Mental Health Service Corps where we took down the 9 million was to actually reflect where their spending will be in the current year. And so moving forward, we are revisiting overall the Mental Health Service Corps in particular and Thrive and will reflect further changes um, between now and the adopted budget. But the, the adjustment current was to actually reflect the spending. So now we are on track to spend at a, at a little over 90% of the budget for Thrive. We're looking at almost a, a $1 billion in funding uh, for Thrive NYC. One of Thrive NYC's signature initiatives, public health diversion centers, is still not operational, but it's budgeted for $9.5 million in both fiscal 2019 and 2020. Why did, N did OMB not reduce the funding for this particular initiative and part of the reduction in Thrive NYC services? We did, we actually um, reflected the funding in the years in which it will be spent as the diversion centers get ramped up. And so if we can give you the numbers for fiscal year. So it was four and a half down in this plan, this is the action that we took. So it's four and a half down in the current year and four and a half up in the next year. Again. Um, it has been a, a challenge on actually getting the diversion center cited and now that they are, we're ready to move with that. All right, well, again, and I know that my time is up. We're talking about transparency a lot lately. Um, I really, really think that we need to revisit this. Um, a billion dollars is a lot. Uh, where, we, where we see in our city right now so many different areas that are in need. Uh, we're speaking about education. We're speaking about transportation. And again, I didn't want to be redundant. My colleagues have spoken about the transportation desert in Southeast Queens over and over and over again. There is no equity there. 
Um, so there is just a lot of disappointment. We feel very, very disrespected um, in this presentation uh, of this budget. And again, my hope is that, and I know that we work well together with you, um, my hope is that we can really, really get someplace palatable for the people of New York, for this New York City Council, because New Yorkers deserve better than this budget. Thank you for your time. Sure. I just wanted to, um, I'm always happy to have a conversation with you about any additional information you need on Thrive. The budget is $250 million annually. I think you referenced a billion number, so it's 250. Um, we have provided the council with a breakdown on that. Anytime you'd like to have conversations about some different components of it, happy to do so. Terrific. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Majority Leader Convell, followed by Councilmember Deutsch. Thank you. Just wanted to uh, begin with just informing you that tomorrow, Metro IAF, which will be comprised of hundreds, if not thousands, of our seniors, will be on the steps of City Hall tomorrow in regards to senior housing. And to this date, we still have not seen where it's reflected the $500 million um, in the city's budget, where seniors with wheelchairs, oxygen tanks, and walkers came to City Hall on the steps uh, to fight for senior housing for themselves, but also for everyone in this room who will be so fortunate to become a senior in their life. So this is an issue that has been um, persistent to say disappointing would be a severe understatement in terms of thousands of seniors went home after the handshake in the budget, believing that through the handshake deal that $500 million was going to be in the budget devoted to, $500 million was going to be in the budget devoted to senior housing. Has the $500 million appeared? Council Member, I know this is a top priority. Um, mm -hmm. You've been consistently bringing it up in the hearings. You also mentioned it when we had our briefing on the executive budget. There was a meeting scheduled, um, and I believe due to scheduling conflicts, it had to be rescheduled to discuss this matter um, with you and at, at your request with the advocates as well. And so I believe we need to get it back on the calendar to discuss where we are with the 500 and the additional units. No, I'm. I'm very aware that the money was not going to reappear, but I want to be on record that I've asked the question, that we've continued to uh, pull back uh, the curtain in terms of the fact that uh, thousands of seniors who came up here to fight for uh, senior affordable housing were essentially duped. And so we want to have an understanding of how that's actually going to be made right and how the seniors and their goals and their promise are going to be kept whole. I just, I think when I'm sitting back and I'm listening to all of my colleagues ask their questions, it's really more on the basis of us coming to the city council with an understanding that we're equal branches of government, that the council is an equal branch of government with the administration. But yet what we see is that we all have priorities. You have 51 members with a priority with priorities, you have a mayor with uh, many priorities. But what consistently happens is the priorities of the city council, 51 members, were all term limited. We want to see certain things happen, such as summer camp opportunities for middle school students, such as our senior housing, all of these different programs that we fight for every year, uh, including now the senior housing, our cultural and libraries, which are uh, the foundation of the city of New York. We're the international cultural icon city of the world. And to have a significant cut come to the culturals and the libraries, which attract people from all over the world, is unfathomable to me. How do you see us as branches of government when the priorities of the mayor are put forward and resourced and funded, and very basic things that the council comes for every year? And I'll give you an example, because I feel like this is strategy. There's no way this administration could not believe, with all of the work that we've been doing, that a summer, a free summer opportunity for middle school age students that are too young to be at home but not old enough to get a job should be left to their own devices for the summer. I believe it's a bargaining chip. It keeps us at a place where every single year we come away with a victory because we restored it and we're kept limited because we're fighting for the same thing over and over again, and we're never able to propel forward because we're fighting for something so basic as summer camp for middle school students. I don't understand that. 
So, Council Member, we, we feel that between the executive budget of last year, we added $125 million in fair student funding that's in the baseline to get to the 93% citywide average. We then, in the preliminary budget of this year, and we I skipped at adoption of last year, we baselined $56 million worth of council priorities that are continuing on, right, not just one year. At prelim of this year, we added $106 million for fair fares. At the executive budget, we added um, $11.6 million for students in shelter. At the, the speaker mentioned, he felt that we did not go far enough. Mm -hmm. We had conversations and came back to $77 million. So it is, we have been having multiple conversations. We're gonna have multiple conversations moving forward, but we have added council priorities. I understand that it is not to the level of the council's response, but we have been responsive in adding a portion of those priorities within the budget. And just to conclude, the 77 and one shots are obviously noted here, but what the council and the speaker have to go through just to get one shots restored it would appear that we could come to a better place of negotiation if in acts of good faith this is like the baseline of what you come back with and then we can negotiate from there i think it's always very difficult for us to be at a place where we're operating at such a baseline deficit that to get one shots restored and this is only half of what was actually asked double was actually asked for in terms of the restoration of the one shots is really disappointing. So we want to continue to work in good faith, but this this sheet that we've got, the $77 million in one shots restored should be the baseline of where the negotiations begin. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, now we have uh, Council Member Deutsch followed by Menchaca and then uh, Chair Gibson, and then that will be it. Thank you, Chair. So um, as Director of the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, um, do you have regular meetings um, with NYPD regarding the safety of New Yorkers? My staff is in regular meetings with regular NYPD. Meetings. So, um, in the wake of uh, recent attacks of houses of worship throughout, uh, in houses of worship throughout the country and throughout the world, it, it became a frightening uh, time for religious New Yorkers uh, attending churches, mosques, and synagogues. Um, although, uh, to my knowledge, uh, there's, no current, there's currently no credible uh, threat, does the administration believe that houses of worships are vulnerable to attacks here in New York City? That question is best answered by the expert who would be the police commissioner and the mayor. To the extent that we need to, if you're asking a question on resources, we are always monitoring, having regular conversations with PD around their resource needs. Obviously, if there was any need to add funding to make sure that houses of worship are protected, we would do so most certainly. Thank you. Now, um, you had uh, in the school security funding um, uh, for the budget uh, fiscal year 2019, um, how much funding was put in in the budget for 2019 for school security? I'm sorry, are you referring to school safety agents, or are you referring? No, for school security uh, guards in private schools. Uh, it's 14 million. 14 million. How much of that uh, 14 million was spent in 2019? That's what we believe the spend will be. You believe it was spent 14 million? The current year to date is 10.7. Sorry, S current year to date is 10.7. I'm sorry? 10.7 in the current, in yes. fiscal year 2020. Mm -hmm. So in fiscal year 2019. Fiscal year 19 is the budget is 14 million. And I believe you were asking of what the year to date spend is, and that's yeah. what we're answering. It's 10.7 in fiscal year 19. 10.7. Uh, so um, I got numbers like 16 million for 2019. Is that not correct? The budget is 14 million. 14 million and 14 million was spent in 2019? We're on track to spend that. We're at 10.7 currently. 10.7. So do you believe it's going to be underspent for this, uh, for this fiscal year? We're looking at 10.7 total. Oh, 10.7 is total mm -hmm. for the whole year. Okay. So we're, we're projecting at 10.7 as pretty much the spend for the total year. Yeah. So you believe the whole entire 10.7 will be spent? Yes. Okay. Um, 
Now, although that the, um, like I mentioned, there's no uh, uh, currently any credible threats. Now, um, we are calling, uh, tomorrow I'm having a press conference, uh, calling on the mayor to fund uh, security for houses of worship, including uh, mosques, synagogues, and, um, and, and churches. Um, so um, I believe that in this day and age, um, you know, when people go into the house of worships, they shouldn't have to look over the shoulder. So I'm asking if we could put additional funding uh, into that, into the budget um, to protect our houses of worships throughout New York City. Again, that's a question that's better answered in terms of assessment of what any security risk is by the expert, which is the police commissioner in consultation obviously with the mayor. I, I have no sense of what that is. I, it's their expertise. If there's some resource need related to what the commissioner is telling us, then we can assess that, but that is best suited for the commissioner to answer. Okay, so as we get closer to while we're having budget uh, talks, so as of now, you have not received any information in regards to um, no, no. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Menchaca, and I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Councilmember Kalos also. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Director Herzog, for being here with us today. I, I just want to get a sense of of the folks that are in the room. Uh, how many of you here are working for the Office of Management and Budget? Raise your hand. OMB team. It's incredible. Awesome. I want to say thank you for your work. Um, this is not easy work, and clearly there's a lot of agreeing to disagree. Um, and I want to just push a little bit of a, uh, I think what's driving me right now and a lot of the council members is a sense that this is a moral document at the end of the day. This puts the priorities of the New Yorkers that we all represent. You have a mega boss, uh, that's real. Um, but I hope that in the, in the midst of these conversations that are happening in closed doors that you get to push as much as you can to things that you hear of any of these things. Uh, inspire you, that you push as much as possible, um, because not only do you have a mega boss, uh, I think that you're, you, you live in the city and you get to see and hear from people in your neighborhood, on the trains, in your schools, or if you have kids. So I'm just, that's a push for you to just keep making this better. Director, um, what I'm concerned about most right now is the census and the money that has been put into the census. Uh, you recently, just a couple hours ago, talked about $8 million going to organizations to do the work when we know that organizations are going to be the best equipped to make the message heard in our communities, immigrant communities. What is your plan to disperse this money uh, for the $8 million? How quickly can you get it out? When's the first moment that the dollar can get onto the street? What's preventing you from making this a council component, um, uh, a kind of council discretionary? dollar uh, allocation, what is the other money going to be used for, uh, and we'll start there. Start there. Okay. Yeah. This is, yeah, we, we're going to start there. Um, so the, the eight million is um, a community-based organization It's in DYCD's budget. As it relates to the timing and the rollout, the agency is better suited to answer those questions along with the deputy mayor. Um, the balance of the funding is going f towards staffing. And then there's about 10 million that's going towards uh, communications um, and media outreach. That's a big component of the plan um, that the deputy mayor felt was really critical to making sure that the message is received. So, And what deputy mayor is this? Thompson. Thompson. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. We're going to meet with him soon. Um, great. So I'm going to be requesting for Julie Menon to come before my executive budget hearing to talk more about it. Clearly, that's not enough for us to kind of get a sense. Of course. Uh, if anybody from DYCD needs to be there, I think we really need to dig deep. Uh, the advocates statewide have given us a charge, $40 million for the city of New York. 20 of those should go to organizations. And so we are severely underfunded uh, for something that's going to impact this budget and the rest of the 10-year plan. Uh, for, for, for New York. And I hope that you can kind of hear that loudly. And if there's anything else that you want to say right now in terms of the census and how we can make it go out quickly, uh, I'd like to kind of hear that. No, I, I think we um, believe that the 26 million is sufficient. Moving forward, if there are additional needs, we'll assess them as we go. We understand that this is a tight timeline to get the work done. And as I said before, every we need to make sure that every New Yorker is counted. It matters significantly. I appreciate that you're going to have Julie uh, Menon come speak to you because I think 
as the lead of our charge here. She's right. best suited to answer your questions on rollout and timeline um, and what efforts she's making, especially around the community-based organizations. Thank you so much for that support. Thank you, Councilmember Kalos. Thank you to uh, Chair Drum for all the great work in leading these hearings. Uh, to our uh, budget director, at the preliminary budget hearing, I asked you about performance budgeting where we would actually say that uh, we're gonna spend X number of dollars to achieve Y results, uh, and also about making the budget a truly transparent document instead of just putting things up in PDF, having them in open formats, even Excel, so that folks can actually crunch the data on their own. You had promised to get back to me. It has been a couple of uh, weeks since then, and uh, that still has not happened. So I wanted to know when that will be available to the general public. And then I think you know the other thing I'll be asking about, because I've asked about it every hearing for five years. Now it's my sixth. In 2014, my district started with only 154 pre-K kindergarten seats for more than 2,000 students. This year, we're on track for 1,122 pre-K for all seats, and 180 are in construction as we speak and slated to open in September. I want to thank the mayor for this huge increase. I also want to thank his office for getting me the number of children who applied this year. Now, as I understand, as offers are being made today, we still don't have enough seats in the neighborhood uh, where folks on Roosevelt Island will be asked to find a place off the island. And I can tell you with a uh, one and a half year old at home, it is not easy to travel with a baby. Uh, it just does not work well with the strollers and public transit. Uh, do we have the funding in the executive budget to meet additional needs such as adding new classrooms to existing schools along the same lines in April 20, April uh, 2017, Kate Taylor in the New York Times wrote, New York City will offer free preschools for all three-year-olds. And uh, she, I, I quote, quote, Mayor de Blasio announced on Monday that New York City will offer free full-day preschool to all three-year-olds within four years. That was in 2017 with a full rollout expected for 2021, which incidentally is when my daughter will turn three. Uh, in a neighborhood where child care expenses easily exceed $30,000 a year. Uh, with 20,000 children in 3K, are we still on track for 2021 and how much funding do we need? That was a lot of questions, so let me start with the top. On the local law 218, which you asked about in terms of um, providing greater transparency, we had a meeting with council finance staff we made adjustments based on that meeting. All the reports are now linked to open data files and the format has been adjusted as you requested. So I believe that that has, we've taken care of that. Thank I can't you. answer the specific questions about the enrollment um, that was provided to you and or how many um, four-year-olds applied and how that lines up. You just got that information. I, I would have to go back. You, I, I, I have the right agency to ask for that not asking you for that I'm just asking about if we have funding in the budget for additional seats if there's a since there is a shortfall we have funded specific sites in the budget and that funding exists to the extent that we need additional funding uh, and added we're always working with DOE on that and adding it as needed but we believe it's there and anything else related to specifics in your district council member I, I really do ask that you ask DOE and in terms of the 3k uh, are we on track for 2021 full rollout as the mayor promised in 2017? Uh, if so, great. If not, how much money do we need and from where? We are on track with our rollout. Um, we did release the citywide RFP. We've always said that for us to keep moving forward, we're going to need state and federal resources. We continue to say that and push for that. So are, how much do we need so that... I, Listen, my, it's $30,000 at, at stake for me and countless other families. How much do we need by when in order to make sure that we roll out by 2021? Well, let me get back to you with the actual breakdown. We will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Chair Gibson. Okay, to close us out. Uh, and thank you again to the entire staff uh, for being here. I know it's been a long morning, um, but 
I wanted to echo uh, the sentiments of Councilmember Chen and just clarify a couple of things. So we had a slide that focuses on the administration's senior club closure plan, and we've looked at DIFTA's own data in terms of analyzing the centers that are nearest to the NYCHA 12 centers that the administration is looking to close. Um, and we believe that there are at least seven today that are over the 100% utilization rate. And so while I understand the proposal is to provide transportation, which is important, um, I also want to just say because I represent two NYCHA's senior centers that are underutilized and they're in public housing. It's much more than transportation. It's about the continuity. It's about the camaraderie that seniors have. And so I want the administration to really work with us on this process because it's much more than providing transportation. We believe that these DIFTA centers that will be asked to absorb more seniors will in fact need more money in their budget. So I'm grateful that you acknowledge that if that is the case, then you're willing to do that. So I just want to reiterate Rate, that we're not talking about the current utilization of the NYCHA 12 centers, but we're talking about the nearby DIFTA centers that we're looking to bring more seniors to um, that we believe are over the current utilization. Yes, happy to have that conversation with you. Want to work very closely as we okay. move with this transition and to the extent that the centers that um, these seniors now can access uh, need additional services to provide the comprehensive services that we want to do that, we can most certainly look at that. Um, we did add a little bit of funding on the margins within this plan because there's, <clears throat> we haven't seen the level of utilization in the centers, or I should say in the clubs that you're referring to. Again, happy to revisit that. But we did add some marginal funding within the plan, assuming that additional seniors from the clubs go to the centers. And we can walk you through that in detail. Okay. In addition to the transportation dollars. Okay. In addition to that, I mean, we also should expect that those DIFTA senses as well may increase their own numbers as well, notwithstanding the seniors that may be coming from the senior clubs at those 12 nights. So I just want to make sure we're covering all of our bases uh, in having this conversation. Agreed. I want to keep them open, but I understand, you know, as we go through the process, we have to make decisions, but I also think we have to look at some of the other variables that are in this conversation. Most certainly. Okay, so I wanted to ask a question about the cluster sites. Um, you and I have had this conversation before. Um, the city recently closed on its acquisition of 22 cluster buildings at 17 different locations. I want to recognize that 14 of those locations are in Bronx County um, at $173 million. And during the prelim budget hearing, uh, we asked Commissioner Steve Banks, and he acknowledged that the administration would continue to explore purchasing additional cluster site buildings and converting those units into affordable housing units. With this particular acquisition, I understand it's going to cover about 70% of our existing cluster housing portfolio, which is very significant. But of course, I remind you of the remaining 30% because I represent many of those buildings. So my question is, what is the update today on the acquisition? Um, how many clusters remain in our portfolio? And is Commissioner Banks, in fact, correct when he says that we are going to continue looking at additional purchases of cluster buildings? He is correct. We are continuing to look at a purchasing of additional cluster buildings. I don't have the number of clusters on me. We can get that to you. Um, how many units is your question? Okay. We will provide it. Okay, and are we on target to phase all of our clusters out by 2023? Uh, we are on target. Uh, the 2023, I'm not sure if that's the correct year. Let me confirm that with Commissioner Banks. Okay, and in addition, we acknowledge that once the acquisition takes place, uh, there are significant capital needs that each of these buildings will need, um, both the cluster families that are phasing out, as well as the traditional tenants that remain in these buildings. So have we started to look at what amounts we believe that the capital will cost in terms of additional need for these buildings once we turn them over to a not-for-profit provider? We're not going to know until the not-for-profit actually um, gets in and does an assessment. And as those assessments are done, we would then reflect those costs in the capital plan. 
So the city's not going to do the assessment. We're going to go through the process of identifying a not-for-profit and then do the assessment? The not-for-profit who's actually managing the development would actually be responsible for managing the site, but also working with us around the assessment of what the rehab needs are for the facility. Okay, and this is fairly new. That's why I'm asking these questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I have a lot of cluster housing in the Bronx. Um, is it at all similar to the TPT program where there will be an intermediary that will take over the deed and then it be transferred to the not-for-profit or does it go directly from the former landlord to a not-for-profit? It's going directly from the, the land, former landlord to the not-for-profit. Okay, okay, I definitely want to keep talking about that because I do recognize there will be costs and obviously we are expecting that if there is an estimated number uh, that should be reflected in the adopted budget so that we can continue to move forward. Um, I think these families have been living in extremely substandard conditions for quite some time, both the cluster families uh, that did not get the sufficient social services that they needed and we acknowledge that, as well as the traditional tenants that have lived there for some time too. Thank you, Chair, we agree. Okay, thank you very much, and we look forward to working with you. I'll turn it back over to our Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Director Hartzog. We appreciate you coming in and uh, giving us information, and we look forward to continuing to work with you and your whole team. Thank you very, very thank much. Thank you, Chair Drum. Okay, and we're gonna take a five minute break, and then we will start with DDC.
Okay. Thank you. We will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by Council Member Vanessa Gibson. We are joined by Council Member Andy Cohen, Council Member Steve Matteo, and um, we just heard from the Office of Management and Budget, and we will now hear from the Commissioner of the Department of Design and Construction, Lorraine Grillo. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement. Uh, but before we hear testimony, I will open the mic to my co-chair, Council Member Gibson. Thank you, Chair Drum, and good afternoon, everyone. It's great to have you here. To our Commissioner Lorraine Grillo of the Department of Design and Construction, welcome. Um, I'm Council Member Vanessa Gibson. I'm proud to serve as Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. I want to thank my co-chair, Chair Danny Drum, for hosting our hearing today. We started early morning, 10 o'clock, uh, with the Office of Management and Budget, and now we have DDC before us this afternoon. Um, at our preliminary budget hearing earlier this year, the Council expressed our concern about DDC's capacity to tackle an expanding workload, including the design and the build out of the borough based jail facilities and taking the lead with improving pedestrian ramp accessibility. I want to commend DDC as well as OMB for listening to the City Council's concerns. Um, while the budget has not changed very much since the prelim, we were very pleased to see that the executive budget now includes money for staff. 66 new positions in key strategic areas, uh, 12 positions for the front end planning unit to review sponsor agency proposals, which is very important to avoid accepting projects with questionable scopes and funding levels and will really help DDC deliver more projects on time, more efficiently um, and more expeditiously. 42 positions to deal with the borough-based jails program to oversee the design, the construction management, the procurement, as well as safety. And this is in addition to the funds that were included in the preliminary budget for a design build specific program management consultant. There are 13 positions to coordinate the installation of pedestrian ramps at many of our street corners to improve accessibility and bring our city into compliance with the ADA. One area where we remain hopeful that DDC would add additional capacity would be one of my favorites, the not-for-profit procurement program. This uses city council discretionary funds to reimburse not-for-profit organizations for certain capital eligible purchases of equipment, vehicles, mobile units, property, or construction projects that really aim to assist in the provision of the organization's public services. Presently, the timeline can stretch out for up to four years, which is beyond frustrating. Um, so I thank you. I recognize when DDC issued its blueprint with all of the internal changes, not just the front end loading, but um, change order unit and really making sure that we can pay our vendors on time is really a great step in the right direction. And through this conversation during this executive budget process, we obviously want to talk a little bit more about the staffing, their responsibilities, and how we can continue to further uh, implement a lot of the vision that was put forth in our blueprint. So I look forward to working with you. Thank you, Commissioner, to you and your team at DDC. And I'll turn it back over to our chair, Danny Drum. Okay, and we're going to ask uh, uh, the council to swear you in and then provide testimony. Uh, do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes. You may proceed. Okay. Well, good afternoon, Chairman Drum, Subcommittee Chair Gibson, and members of the committee. My name is Lorraine Grillo, and the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Design and Construction. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on DDC's fiscal year 2020 executive budget. I'm joined today by members of DDC's leadership team. The executive capital commitment plan expands on the January plan, increasing to a historic $11 billion over the next decade. The majority of this work, $8 billion, is focused on core water, core water, sewer, and transportation infrastructure. That commitment to infrastructure is a, a testament to the city's foresight and planning. While officials in Washington can spend years debating a national infrastructure bill, we are not waiting. 
we are making the necessary investments now so that future generations can enjoy the benefits of reliable infrastructure, beautiful public spaces, and quality public services. In FY20 alone, DDC's commitment plan includes nearly $3 billion in new commitments, again focused largely on water, sewer, and streets. The portfolio for DDC's Public Buildings Division is also forecast to grow. The executive budget includes $436 million in commitments for NYPD facilities and $375 million for sanitation facilities over 10 years. DDC will also be doing a lot of work for our three library systems in the coming years, committing $411 million through FY 2023. Working with OMB, we have also taken steps to flatten the capital plan to more accurate, accurately reflect capital commitment rates. DDC's fiscal 2020 operating budget is $189 million. This includes $141 million for personal, personnel services and a budgeted headcount of 1,555. The operating budget includes $145 million in IFA funds, $13 million in federal funds, and $30 million in the city's expense funding. The DDC budget also includes $48 million for OTPS needs. Finally, DDC has worked closely with OMB to identify $2.4 million <laughs> in FY19 and FY20 for PEGS to help the city meet its current cost control objectives, as well as $627,000 in baseline out-year reductions to its budget for any future efforts of this nature. DDC continues to aggressively pursue its capital program and increase industry participation. Since I last appeared before this committee in late March, we celebrated with the mayor and council member Borelli the completion of the new Joseph A. Verdino Jr. Field of Dreams at the South Shore Little League in Staten Island. This beautiful new facility includes a new grandstand with covered seating areas for 275 people, energy efficient lighting, and a range of other first class amenities. <clears throat> with Council Member Richards, we kicked off our latest Southeast Queens infrastructure project an $84 million effort to alleviate flooding in Brookville, adding more than two miles of new sewers and improving streets, part of a $1.9 billion long-term commitment of this administration to building out stormwater infrastructure for Southeast Queens. Working with DOT, we also reopened the fully renovated West 229th, Street, 229th Step Street in Council Member Cabrera's district, which connects Health Ave Heath Avenue at the lowest point to Kingsbridge Terrace at, the high at its highest in the hilly terrain of the Western Bronx. DDC also joined the SCA in April to host a joint MWBE procurement fair. More than 700 businesses were represented at the fair. Which, also, which had also 60 exhibitors, including 20 city agencies seeking to fulfill the mayor's MWBE goals. In the coming months, I will have the pleasure of participating in several more ribbon cuttings and groundbreakings for DDC projects, as well as STEAM events, including resiliency training for DOE teachers and DYCD after-school providers at the Lower East Side Girls Club this June. Also, our high school and college graduate summer internships will begin. As I made clear in March before this committee, DDC is working extremely hard on several fronts to change the way it does business to deliver projects more reliably. A major part of this effort, and one the council has heard about, is to better control the project initiation process and enhance our planning efforts to ensure that every project has all the necessary elements in place to be, to be successful before we take it on. 
the days of DDC accepting a project that is not fully scoped or adequately budget, budgeted are gone. We are in the, also in the process of hiring staff to enhance the AIMS program. This staff will take a hard, look, hard spade look work of reviewing city assets and helping develop sensible long-term capital planning strategies. This is the building block of creating a better capital planning process. We are also making important progress on moving key parts of our strategic blueprint forward. Among other things, since I appeared here in March, we have established standardized design and construction durations in our infrastructure and public buildings divisions finalized our initial four pilot projects for the expanded allowance for work, streamlining the change order process, and worked with OMB to increase the threshold for blanket certificates to proceed for DEP projects. These efforts we can actually measure to determine if we are moving the needle, and measure them we will. We are building out a, a key performance indicator program that will allow us to hold ourselves accountable. We will continue to enact our plan on many other fronts and ag aggressively change how we do business. I encourage you to keep our blueprint, blueprint on your desk as a measuring stick for our progress. And please continue to make suggestions and ask questions. This effort will require continual collaboration with the Council and other oversights with our sponsor agencies and the communities where we work. But we remain committed to seeing it through. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, and uh, before we get started, I just want to say we've been joined by Councilmember Rosenthal. Um, in the executive plan for fiscal 2020, DDC added $685 million to its capital commitment plan bringing it to a total of $10.9 billion over five years. Mm -hmm. This represents more than 12% of the city's total capital plan. Uh, with this increase of $685 million, does the agency have the capacity to complete all of the projects in a timely manner? I believe we do. Um, as we continue through these major projects, for example, uh, our PEDRAM program and the off Rikers program, if the needs arise, we will continue to work with OMB to get the additional headcount. So have you asked OMB for additional, uh, head, uh, additional numbers? Not at this moment, uh, but we will continue to monitor these, pro these uh, projects as they, as they move along. Okay. Um, just want to talk a little bit about borough-based uh, jail program. Yes. In fiscal 2020, DDC added funding of $3.3 in the fiscal 2020 and a baseline $4.5 million starting in 2021 and beyond for 41 positions associated with the borough-based jail program. What is the scope of work of these new employees and when are you planning on filling these positions? Um, <clears throat> Again, at this point, and, and Councilmember Gibson mentioned uh, our PMC program, our project man uh, managing uh, corporation that we hired recently, and we're just getting up to speed with that, pro with that consultant who is working with our teams and working with um, the communities and, and moving forward in that way. Certainly, we are looking at ways to design those projects. So we're not at the point at this moment where we need additional staffing to implement the program. We're at the very earliest stages. So you feel the 41 is sufficient? Absolutely, at this moment. Okay. And um, in terms of what that planning looks like, is it um, that they're going to help decide usage for the space? Uh, like uh, first floor will be commercial, retail, or Exactly. Uh, second floor auditorium, et cetera, so forth and so on. Is that the idea? Exactly correct. Okay, good. Uh, we've heard that the Bronx Hall of Justice, which just opened in 2017, represents a missed opportunity where the process failed to adequately engage the community and end, and end users. And the completed project presents significant logistical challenges for those who work there every day. At the preliminary budget hearing, you spoke in general terms about your plans for the community and elected official engagement with the borough-based jail design. 
Can you tell us about any specific plans DDC has to work with the community and corrections officers to make sure the new jails rise to this challenge? Sure. Sure. Uh, be happy to respond to that, Council Member. Um, so the borough-based jails project is in the Euler process right now. Um, there's been a considerable amount of work done already uh, in the uh, master plan that was created. Uh, as the commissioner mentioned, uh, once we're through Euler, uh, we've added substantial capacity, uh, project management consultant, and we'll be adding uh, substantial staff to do the work of preparing the designs for each of the facilities. Um, there will be com community engagement and stakeholder engagement within all of that work. Um, and uh, uh, one of the ways that uh, we'll be doing that is with uh, a design advisory group that's been established, co-chaired by the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and DDC uh, to work with key stakeholders on designs as we move forward. Uh, and we'll be finding other opportunities to do that as well. In terms of the height of these buildings, um, who will be making those decisions ultimately? Um, the, uh, I think there's a proposal that's in ULERP. It's been subject to environmental review. So that's the, and I believe the, the uh, Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice, the Department of Corrections, and others within uh, city government are taking that forward through ULERP, and that's where the City Planning Commission and uh, ultimately the Council will be making the decision about what the maximum allowable will height is. Will the City Planning Commission be um, uh, giving an opinion about the height? I, I believe that there's an approval of the, uh, the height in the ULERP. Okay. Uh, All right. Um, design build. Currently the state allows design build uh, procurement on selected projects statewide with scant few authorized in New York City. Uh, is the DDC working with the state legislature to get authorization to use design build in New York City? Absolutely, uh, Council Member. We've been, um, many of us here have been to Albany a number of times uh, working with our state legislature to see if we can get some more design build authorization. How much faster do you think um, projects can proceed with design build versus traditional uh, methods? Uh, that's that's a really difficult question. Um, it really depends upon the project itself. Uh, again, design build works for some projects, not for every project. It's a tool that we need in our toolbox to continue to work. Um, I'm going to say, have we estimated, and I'll ask my colleague if we've estimated anything on the off rikers program, any savings on that? Um, in, in total on the off rikers program, I don't think we have an exact number, but in the course of uh, setting up that program, we've taken a look and seen that there are precedents where we can save between 12 and 18 months on a project of that scale because of design build. Important. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Chair Gibson now. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, to you and the team at DDC. Uh, we appreciate all the work you're doing, and certainly as we continue to add more to the capital plan, uh, that means that DDC will have more work. I <laughs> uh, wanted to ask about the staffing and the resources for the front end planning unit that I talked about. Um, the additional city funding of 1.3 million in fiscal 2020, and in the out years for all costs associated with 12 positions for the front end planning unit specifically that's been around since about 2016. Um, have you identified with these new employees that we'll be adding to enhance the efficiency of the overall capital budget process, what their roles will be within the front end planning unit, and also do you have a time frame on when you believe that those positions will be filled? Okay, that's a good question. Um, yeah. First of all, our front end planning unit uh, really has a, a number of different things that they do, okay, which a, a lot of them are investigation, estimating, um, just seeing if projects are feasible, if they can be done, what are the um, impediments to moving forward on a particular project. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a lot of different um, uh, areas of expertise, engineering, architecture, um, 
<clears throat> estimating those kinds of things. So uh, at this point, I don't know what each and every one of these people will be doing. But I will sell, tell you that we have several um, hires in the process right now uh, that are moving forward, and we anticipate that within the next several months we will have those positions filled. Okay. And before this hiring takes place, what does the front end planning unit look like today in terms of headcount? Because you describe multiple roles right. uh, and different people that are tasked with just different responsibilities. Sure. Yes. Hi, uh, Justin Walter, uh, CFO, DDC. Um, so the front end planning unit uh, is was originally funded at a headcount of about 18. Um, so this is an additional 12 heads to bring us to 30. Um, staff on uh, budget right now, I believe is 18 total. Um, we're in the hiring process for the balance effectively now that we've gotten the authorization for the additional 12 heads. Okay, great. And I'm, so, I'm sure the answer is yes, but I'll ask anyway. Um, do you anticipate that this increase, and I would love to understand um, in terms of how we came up with this particular number of 12, um, even though we don't exactly know what their responsibilities will be just yet within the unit, um, but do you expect that this increase in headcount will improve the overall client agency, uh, customer service experience that clients are dealing with DDC in the everyday work? Right. I do agree with that, but I might say that one of the reasons for the increase or the expansion is the increase in projects. We want our front-end planning unit to review every single project. So right now they are limited in the number of projects that they can review, but they have all those areas of expertise now. What we want to do is expand it so that they can get into every single project. Okay. And I'm looking at these beautiful pictures of step streets and museums, <laughs> pedestrian plazas, and they look gorgeous. Um, and just speaking from personal experience, uh, some of these projects take quite a bit of time. Um, some are better than others, and I guess, you know, just to understand, um, the projects that the front end planning unit does take and accept, and also we talked about prior prioritization, um, because I wanted to make sure that some of the smaller projects that are not necessarily in the bulk of your portfolio, about 56% of your projects are really dedicated to DEP and DOT portfolio, which is important, um, but what are we doing within the blueprint to make sure that the smaller capital projects, uh, the remainder of that 56% are also prioritized as well? So I know you know, like myself, Council Member Cohen, Northern Manhattan and the Bronx, we care about step streets yes. because that's really a huge mode of transit for many pedestrians. And a lot of New Yorkers don't always know what step streets are, but they're gorgeous. Once they're complete, they're gorgeous. Um, but those are not necessarily like a DEP infrastructure project, but rather still important, um, not, you know, millions and millions of dollars, but still very important. So how does that front end planning unit prioritize some of the smaller right. capital projects? Again, um, first of all, I, I had no idea what a step street was until I know, we most opened people it, <laughs> the one in the Bronx in your district, <laughs> um, and they are beautiful. They really are. Um, I think, again, as I said earlier, the goal here is that every single project go through the front end planning process, that every one of them uh, walk, start with us with adequate funding and a scope that we can all agree on. And once that happens, you will see how much more quickly these projects get done because we will not have to stop, start, stop, start every time there's information about a difference in scope or any time there's additional funding needed, we want to start on the right foot. And that, I think, is going to be the difference with an increased front-end planning group. Okay. Um, recently, uh, one of our terms and conditions that the City Council received um, in the first half of fiscal 2019, the front-end planning unit um, at DDC initiated three parks projects out of a total of 51 projects. So I wanted to ask specifically about parks. I'm bringing up an agency uh, that we've been working very closely with that I know has had many challenges, um, but I wanted to understand if parks only submitted three parks projects to DDC to manage, um, and if so, what can we do as DDC to work closely with parks 
to potentially look at some of their capital projects. Um, I'm, I'm sure you understand, Commissioner, our frustration on park projects. And we love to open parks, but we don't open as many as we possibly can for many reasons. Um, parks has done a series of different amendments to their internal bidding process, looking at more bidding um, and other diversity measures. And I've been helpful with that because I've had a lot of projects where the um, the design was slowed down a little bit, as well as the vendor, you know, mm -hmm. basically didn't comply with the contract rules, <laughs> so we had to start all over. I've had some <laughs> real horror stories. Um, but I wanted to understand specifically with these three, was that initiated by them, and what could we do more to work on park projects? Well, as far as those three projects, the projects that come to us come at the request of the sponsor the agency. agency. Okay. So for, for those three projects, they have come to us. Um, and again, we recognize some of the issues that parks uh, has to deal with because we we actually deal with similar issues in terms of pro uh, pro contractors that are not performing and how we main how we continue and move forward on these projects um, i work very closely with the commissioner of parks uh, any improvements that we can make we will share with them and any improvements they make they will share with us okay and i just wanted to um make sure that we were clear the three projects that we saw was the a rockaway project at about 14 million uh, coney island beach headquarters at 47 million and the tilden rec center at 55 million so at first when we got the information we thought these were like huge capital projects so we were just wondering if there was some mechanism behind uh, the reason why these particular three park projects were were sent to ddc um Again, we, we work closely with the sponsor, and they asked us to help with these three, and we are more than happy to do so. Okay. So I wanted to ask, as we keep talking about communication with a lot of the client agencies, uh, in terms of communication and our interagency work, do the client agencies have a project manager on staff for the projects that DDC is completing uh, on their behalf? So is there a point person that... DDC works with at the particular client agency to sure. manage these projects? Sure. Okay. Um, we work with a liaison uh, from the sponsor agency, but we are managing the design and construction of these projects. DDC, are the we are the construction arm. Some of these sponsor agencies do not do construction. Others do. For example, uh, the libraries. Uh, we manage projects start to finish. In other cases, we work very, very closely with the sponsor agencies and their liaison. Uh, and again, we're in constant contact. Okay, so that means just ongoing meetings and yes. communication? Correct. Updates on progress, et cetera? Correct. Okay. Have, has there been any instances where projects have been reassigned back to a particular client agency after DDC has accepted that particular project? Not that For I'm aware of. any reason? Not okay. that I'm aware of. Okay. No. Okay. So I wanted to ask uh, quickly about the non-city capital. And we've talked about this uh, during the <laughs> preliminary hearing. Uh, we had a very, very productive conversation about contracts being registered for not-for-profit recipients of city council discretionary funds for our capital for goods, vehicles, equipment. I'm a big fan of mobile units. I fund those a lot. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the staffing levels today in this not-for-profit procurement program in the unit and if you believe we need to add more staff to accelerate these projects. Some of these smaller capital projects have been outstanding for quite some time. And as we add more capital projects, we wanted to understand what the staffing looks like and if there is going to be a request to add more staff to the unit. Uh, yes, I'm gonna to introduce to you our general counsel, David Baroli, whose unit yes. actually manages this process. Yes, we've met, we know you. <laughs> we need Hi. more staff. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, Chair Gibson. Uh, thank you for the leading question. But um, I'm actually going to do something that is not normally done. I'm, I'm going to say why well, I appreciate the offer. And just to give you a, a recap, we have three staff members um, dedicated to this program. And following our last conversation at the last hearing, I went back and spoke to the team. And we really talked. We had a good heart-to-heart -heart talk about what the issues and the impediments are. And while I do think staffing is needed, 
I actually don't think the staffing is needed within DDC. The organizations, the not-for-profits, both from the large hospital organizations, which may be a little bit surprising, to even the very small mom-and-pop shops, the issue that we have seen is one, it's continuity of the actual staffing, and then two, it's, it's the understanding of what is required. And I think maybe the people that are filling out the questionnaire, working with your office and your colleagues' offices, they may not be fully versed on what the requirements are. So for example, I brought today a copy of a draft handbook. We, we've been giving out this handbook over the last couple of years. This one, I'm only saying it's in draft because we haven't finalized it with the new information for the new fiscal year. But within this document are four, and I talked about it last time, I'm a big lover and believer in checklists. We've got four different checklists to take the not-for-profit through each step of the process. Then behind each checklist are literally samples. We have put together samples of what a payment requisition looks like. We put together a sample of what a CP looks like. And we've really spelt it out. And I don't know what more we can do. I mean, I mentioned last time Bruce Rudolph. He literally calls up each not-for-profit, talks to them, goes out to their facility to walk them through the handbook. Sometimes he takes one or two of the other two staff members. Um, there's just a lot that goes into it. And then, unfortunately, what happens is things go very dormant, quiet three, six, nine, 12 months. And we will then start following up, but we have a lot of different projects that are coming in the queue. And then we'll, we'll, we'll find out that the person that we dealt with was no longer there. And no one advised us of the transition to who the new person was. Again, it's not a problem problem, but Bruce will then go back out and meet with the new person, bring the new handbook, and say, OK, well, let's walk through the steps one more time. Um, so I, again, I appreciate the offer. I understand why you would, would say, hey, maybe we need more staff. But in looking at everything we've been doing, I really think the not-for-profits need more help. And I don't know what that help looks like. Um, but before I walked in um, today, I did speak with Nathan of your staff, who again, I said last time, we have this amazing relationship. We're going to sit down after this and also talk about some of the ideas and issues that we have been really kicking around at our agency is to see what we can do to streamline this process. Okay, I appreciate that. And I think the handbook is a great idea, but I would also ask that you know maybe DDC could look at allocating additional resources to help walk our not-for-profits through the compliance process. Um, to talk about potential delays. And I understand inconsistencies with executive directors and the chairs of boards, and you know, just in terms of staff changes, I, I get that. But I do think you know, we should look at this again to see what we can do as an agency. And that doesn't preclude us from if it means adding more to the headcount of four that you describe and that one person be dedicated to serving as the liaison to help in addition to the handbook. The handbook is great, but I also think you know we should look at what DDC can do as well to add more resources within the agency to help because this process is only going to be further exacerbated as you have more council members adding more capital projects. And so if we don't take the opportunity now to address it, I feel like it will get just potentially worse. A absolutely. And more projects will be delayed. Thank you, yes. Okay, so yes, we need more staff. Yes, I'm going to speak with Nathan about the staff. <laughs> Just have to circle back. Yep. Um, I had a question about the Red Hook, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. Um, Carlos Menchaca would appreciate this. Um, the fiscal 2020 executive capital commitment plan includes $100 million in fiscal 2022 in funding for the ad advanced uh, resiliency project in Red Hook, Brooklyn, to protect the neighborhoods against sea level rise. And this Integrated Flood Management Agency project is a part of a larger $20 billion resiliency plan that the city is implementing really around all five boroughs. Um, how does the agency plan to spend the $100 million that's been provided to DDC for this project? And my second question always is, do we have a timeline on spending the funds? Right. I'll, I'll uh, happy to take that, Council Member. Um, so as you say, the Red Hook Hazard Mitigation Grant Funded Project is a $100 million project. Um, uh, we do believe that the $100 million will fully fund the project. Uh, and the project has been the subject of an extensive feasibility study um, that's looked at uh, scope and engineering questions. Uh, basically, the preferred alternative 
<coughs> coming out of that study uh, it has two components. Uh, it's raising uh, the grade of Beard Street in the southern part of Red Hook uh, and raising uh, the, the edge level of uh, a portion of the uh, neighborhood adjacent to the uh, cruise terminal uh, in the western portion. Uh, and the goal of uh, that uh, edge raising is to address a, uh, uh, a fairly frequent uh, storm and its uh, flood conditions that are associated with it. Uh, so DDC has just received that project uh, and the feasibility study that was conducted and will be moving into uh, design procurement uh, and design and then into construction subsequently. We'll have more information about exact timing as we move through that design process. Okay, do you, will design start this year or 2020? Uh, I believe design is starting this year. Okay. But we will, I'll get back and confirm whether it's this year or early next year. Okay, great. I'll turn it back over to Chair Drum. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Rosenthal. Thanks. I'll appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner, always great to see you. Thanks for all your hard work. And your testimony, what's in your testimony is really exciting because um, I'm particularly drawn to the procurement efficiencies that you're talking about here. And what I'd like you to do is just give, I know you're still, these are good bones to um, new systems. And I know you're still working on what they'll exactly be. But can you think of one example where you could say like with change orders or something that is a slog where here's the slog that currently exists or the, the um, repetitive process that's unnecessary and here's exactly how we're going to fix it? Sure. Um, thank you for the question. Um, we've recently uh, put together our, what we call our CACO unit, our change, uh, what, what is it? The acronym? Construction Allowance and Change Order Task Force. Correct. Okay. So we have a task force that consists of folks who review change orders as well as our EAO, as, you, as you're familiar with. Um, typically, what would happen before was these were different units. And if a question arose from the change order unit or from the EAO, for example, um, they would maybe put a call into the change order unit who could potentially get back to them within a few days, maybe not. And this was, it was a very long, confusing process. Having these folks all sitting together yes. allows that conversation to happen immediately and answers to happen immediately. And so I think just that's a, a perfect example of how we as an organization can do this better. And so, you know, there's a million different things. One of the things that we talked about was our um, construction allowance uh, pilot program that we're working with OMB on right now. I think that that will absolutely speed up our projects, allow our contractors to get paid and stay solvent and continue working. And so that's a very, very big deal. Awesome, very excited about this. Um, on the human services <laughs> sector side, the thought is that Passport, when it's fully, are you fami familiar with, you are, um, that when Passport is fully implemented, all three phases, that it could save the human service providers um, almost $800 million cumulatively annually, which is the cost of not being paid on time, et cetera. Correct. Do you think there would be cost savings in the sense of construction companies will know now with the new system that's coming in or has already been five years from now when it's already in place and secure, do you think bids might actually come down because projects, bidders now know that they're not going to have to wait a year to be reimbursed or you know, whatever? I, I, that's a very good question. Um, I think that there will, if, if nothing else, there will be much more competition because people who have avoided working for the city and city government will come back knowing that they will get paid regularly. And I think that that competition may just allow those pr prices to go down. 
Great, that's, that's really exciting. Um, and lastly, do, does DDC participate in the Passport system? Absolutely, absolutely. All the projects go through Passport? Yes. It will, yes. It will. Are you currently part of it? Are, are the companies that you work with, are yes. they registered yes. um, users? And when bids go out, they bid through the pa Passport system. What stage are you at? Yeah. So the replacement of Vendex and, and companies signing up, um, that happens through, uh, through Passport now. Yeah. The um, source to contract piece, the actual carrying out of the procurement process, that's one of the later phases of Passport. So the actual yeah. bidding doesn't happen through Passport yet, but will. Um, and, and we do participate, our ACO does, um, the, the commissioner level at the, high, at the executive steering committee level participate in the Passport development with MOX. Okay, and it's a good fit? Yeah, I think we're hopeful that it's going to help <laughs> us, yes. Oh, we're all hopeful. Thank you so much. Thank you to your team. Thank really you. appreciate you, Commissioner. Thank you, yeah. Chairs. Thank you very much. We don't have too much more to ask, but I'm just curious to know, because I saw one of the photos with the Elmhurst Library there, which is a beautiful project. Yes. But um, I was told, and I've seen, uh, that the slates in the garden um, were, uh, or somebody said they were a tripping hazard and that um, they had to close off the garden um, and then they couldn't have somebody come back within a five year time frame because the capital project had been completed. Is that true or um, I, think they, I think the issue may have been resolved but I'm just curious to, curious to know what the rule is around that. If there's, an, if there's an issue with a project that's been completed, do they have to wait, do you have to wait five years before we can go back and get that issue taken care of? I think the contractor has responded, forgive me, a couple of things. I think Elmhurst Library is complete and looking very beautiful right mm -hmm. now, so I think that that issue has been resolved. I think the contractor who completes the project has a responsibility to fit, fix all punch list items. I don't know that if that was particularly included, um, but I certainly can check and get back to you. But asking a contractor to come back after a year or two um, to do additional work or different work, I, I would imagine it is, is not eligible. It's not eligible. Right. And, and there's no, are there guarantees written into the work that they've done that it will last at least the five years? Yes. Yes, there are, there are. But they still can't be held accountable to bring them back to again, fix it if it's not. Again, I would say that if there is a, a, a particular piece of work that was done, that was either done incorrectly uh, or needs, uh, well, done incorrectly, I think that that is the contractor's responsibility. If there is something different, for example, I don't like that particular surround, then it's no longer the contractor's responsibility. And that is an item that would not be capital eligible. So it's, it's a question of what the issue is. Is it a defect? Is it something that the contractor did not do correctly and needs to be fixed or repaired? That's his responsibility. Uh, just on the same note, um, you know, I have Diversity Plaza in my district also. So last year when the trees were um, planted, the trees were installed, it was very hot and the trees started to wilt and the leaves started to fall off. They weren't being watered correctly or something was wrong. But in that case, um, I was told that there was a year and a half guarantee on those trees. So is that true with any of those types of projects that you, that you do? I, and there was arguments between DDC and Parks as to how deep to plant those trees. <laughs> I'm sure there was. <laughs> There are various components of every, any uh, construction project. For example, a roof project may have a 10-year warranty. Uh, various windows may have a different length of warranty. But most of those things are packaged into the construction contract. Or if, for example, it's a particular piece of equipment that comes in with a particular guarantee or warranty. As far as trees are concerned, I. It's a year and a half. Okay.
year. Okay, well, I think actually the trees are coming in stronger now, so I'm, I'm happy about that, but uh, just curious to know. Good. Okay, I don't think we have anything else for you at this point. Uh. I'm sorry, one last question? Just one more question. Yep. Sure. I wanted to ask about the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, um, which I understand is a multi-year project, and the commitment plan has about $1.2 billion. I wanted to ask, has there been any update on the design phase of the project since the prelim to date, and can you provide us with any details? Um, sure, council member, happy to do that. We're, um, we continue to work our way through design. Um, the entire project is in the preliminary design stage at this point, and we'll be moving into more detailed design documentation. The goal is for us to complete design by uh, November of this year so that we can bid out the project. That's an update, thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for coming thank in. You. And you. Um, with that, this meeting is adjourned.